seven o'clock. <laughs> Good evening. The April 9th, 2024 regular meeting of the Mentor Exempted Village Board of Education is called to order. This meeting is being held in accordance with section 3313.15 of the Ohio Revised Code. Please place your mobile phones on silent mode for the meeting. Mr. Wade, please call the roll. Ms. Iapolo. Here. Ms. Jessling. Present. Ms. Marchaza. Present. Ms. Payne. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Thank you, and please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to welcome everyone to the April 9th, 2024 regular meeting of the Mentor Exempted Village Board of Education. Prior to, <clears throat> prior to this evening, each board member has received for their review and consideration the agenda and materials associated with each agenda item for the board's approval via the district's paperless Board of Education Agenda System board docs. The public can access the agenda through the school district's website and the agenda is available through the district's website for public viewing the Sunday prior to the board meeting. Board members have the opportunity to call the superintendent and chief financial officer for information concerning agenda items and to request if needed additional information. There are two places on the agenda when the board entertains comments from the community. The first hearing of the public is dedicated to those who wish to address the board on agenda items only. The second hearing of the public is dedicated to those who wish to address the board on any subject, whether it be an item on the agenda or another topic. To participate in the hearing of the public section, interested speakers must sign up prior to the start of the meeting. Signups are available online through the school district's website or on site prior to 7 p.m. You will be called to the microphone when it is your turn to speak. And at that time, we ask that you please state your name and address questions to the board president. Each person may speak only once per segment and comments are limited to three minutes. The purpose of the hearing of the public is for our community members to address the board. The board continues to welcome feedback from the community as an important component to conducting business. This is an information gathering opportunity for the board and administration so that we can work to best serve our community. If at the end of the public participation we do not make a statement, please know this does not demonstrate a lack of care for comments shared by our community. Rather, we want to be thoughtful in our approach and we will provide a response in a timely manner when appropriate. This meeting, <clears throat> this meeting is being shown live and can be viewed on demand on our YouTube channel, Cardinal TV Mentor Ohio. Thank you. And at this time, we have district highlights and recognitions. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade. Tonight, we are recognizing several student athletes for their outstanding achievements. I'd like to invite Mr. Casella to the podium to begin our presentations. <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Heath and Mr. Wade. The Manor High School Athletic Department had another great winter season with many conference, sectional, district, and state competitors and a great, number, a great deal of success. I am honored tonight to present members of our boys and girls swimming team, our boys and girls wrestling teams, and our gymnastic team who qualified for state competition this past season. As always, they have represented Mentor High School in a first-class manner, giving everything they have. Of course, with all the spring activities and things we have, not too many of them could make it tonight, but we're going to recognize the ones who are, are with us here tonight. First, I'd like to recognize members of our boys and girls swim team. Uh, all of them, all of these individuals that I'm going to bring up uh, qualified for our state competition, the OHSA state meet, and uh, some of them had pretty amazing uh, races down there. Uh, Madison Andrus, she qualified in the 200 medley relay. I don't think Madison is here. Uh, Annie Burrow qualified in the 200 medley relay, the 200 free relay, the 50 free, and the 100 free. I don't believe Annie's here tonight. Marlena Child, she qualified in the 200 medley relay and the 200 free relay. Marlena, come on up. Uh, 
Uh, Ruthie Gemmon qualified in the 200 medley relay and the 200 free re relay. I don't believe Ruthie's here. Juli Juliana Selenka qualified in the 200 free relay and the 500 free. And then uh, last, our, our solo boy qualifier, Dylan Tackett. I believe Dylan's here. He qualified in the 50 free. By the way, this year, Dylan set the school record in the 50 free, so congratulations to Dylan. <laughs> Moving on to our gymnasts, we had one gymnast who qualified for the state competition. I don't believe Paige is here this evening, no. um, but Paige uh, was our lone state qualifier in gymnastics. She had a great state meet. She finished sixth overall in the floor exercise and 18th overall in the all-around competition. So a great season from Paige. Finally, I'd like to recognize uh, members of our boys and girls wrestling teams who advanced to the state championship meet this year. I know my two head coaches are here, Coach Lamana and Coach Carl. If you could join me up here, please, to help with certificates. We had two qualifiers from our from the girls' side, Lorelai Megary. I believe Lorelai's here. <laughs> and Maddie Menchaca. Both Lorelai and Maddie had great district tournaments here at the district tournament we hosted here at Metter and qualified for the state meet. Uh, and they did a great job down at the state competition. They represented us very well. So congratulations to both Lorelai and Maddie. Next up on the boys' side, uh, we had a few uh, wrestlers who are here with us tonight advance to the state meet. Diego Stropko was a district runner up and he qualified for the state meet. Diego's here. <laughs> Jack DeBow finished third at the district qualifying for the state meet, but I don't believe Jack could be here tonight. Next, we have Nick Blackburn. Nick finished as district runner-up, qualified for the state meet, and at the state meet, he finished third in his weight class in the state of Ohio. Antonio Shelley was another uh, state qualifier. He was district runner-up, and he finished eighth overall in his weight class at the state meet. Unfortunately, Antonio could not be with us tonight. And our final state qualifier was Liam Lloyd. Liam finished as district runner-up to qualify for the state meet. So please join me in congratulating all of our winner state qualifiers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, we'll take a short break to allow for anyone who would like to leave. That is the approval of minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Apollo. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Next, we have hearing of the public on agenda items only. First speaker is Cynthia Braley from 6260 Furwood Road. Hello. 
um, I am up here again, as I was last month, um, asking a question that still has not been answered. Um, I just wanted the board's clarification or interpretation of their um, book challenges or materials challenges policy. I have emailed everybody on the board more than six weeks ago. Um, and then I spoke also at the last board meeting and asked those questions of you. And then I also emailed you again. The only two people that have responded are Rose and Annie. I would expect at least that the board president would have responded. Um, which also then leads me to the new business topic of um, public participation, which I can assume is um, in regards to people coming up here and repeating things and how long this all takes. Well, if we got responses to the questions we asked, we might not come up here repeatedly. So I'm still going to wait, I guess, for my response to the email and to what I said at the last board meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mackenzie McAllister from Tall Oaks Drive. Good evening. Um, I am taken back by the books that you all have approved. Um, and I was not at the last meeting, and I am about to read again, some of the excerpts and some of the things that people have said that, oh, it's great for counseling and people can, or if it happens to these children, they'll feel free to talk about it. No, you feel free to talk about it to a counselor or a professional. You don't make that child go through that trauma again. You are not doctors, you are not counselors, you are not equipped to take care of our children in that way. So let's get on with the books that you have approved which we have asked to be removed. I love that you're rolling your eyes at me, Ms. Jesselneg. Yes, go ahead and gawk at me. So Excuse let's, me. let's go through this. Excuse me. Excuse me. Just please address the, the tightness of her vagina was more than he could bear. His soul seemed to slip down to his gut and fly into her, and his gigantic thrust he made into her, then provoked the only sound she made. A hollow suck of air in the back of her throat. The rapid loss of air from the circus balloon following disintegration. The falling away of sexual desire. He was conscious of her wet, soapy hands on his wrists, the fingers clenching, but whether her grip was from a hopeless but stubborn struggle to be free from some other emotion, he could not tell. Removing himself from her was so painful to him, he was cut, he cut it short and snatched his genitals out of the dry harbor of her vagina. She appeared to have fainted. Charlie stood up and could only could only see her grayish, I'm sorry, like this is making me so upset to read this, that our children have this available in a library. Charlie stood up and could only see her grayish panties, so sad and limp around her ankles. Again, the hatred mixed with tenderness. The hatred would not let him pick her up. The tenderness forced him to cover her. I'm going to stop there. This book is about a father raping a daughter. And you all approve this. We are asking for two books to be removed. It is plain and simple. I don't care about your red light, green light, whatever it is. It's inappropriate. No child should have it there, period. I am disgusted for any of you sitting on this board right now that actually had this approved. Thank you. No, thank you. Lynn Mazika, 8690 Cliffwood Court.
Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Heath, Mr. Wade, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I was unable to attend the March meeting, but I watched it on the school's channel, and I appreciate you having that on so that we can watch it. I was impressed with the suggestion to further refine the policy on checking out books from the school library. The idea of three levels of parental permission makes so much sense. First of all, it allows complete control of books be being checked out to the parents who desire that level of involvement. And second, it will allow the administration to better spend their time on issues that pertain to all students instead of reviewing books. That is better done by the parent for their particular child than for the district as a whole and takes up a great deal of time of the superintendent. But best of all, in a year where there's been so much division among the board, it is an idea that all five members seem to be behind. Maybe this will be the start of many new ideas supported by the entire board. I know there are many issues that all five of you agree on to make our school system better. And since this is National Library Week, this is a great time to be working on books. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Halad from Reynolds Road. Hearing that kind of language is very um, traumatizing, especially when you have more students in this district who have been sexually assaulted than you have uh, kids that have gender confusion. So you're putting the top, uh, uh, the 99 percentile below the, the less than 1 percent. Um, I was wrong in my last speech, so I'm gonna correct myself. Um, Mentor High School ranks uh, in the top 50% of all schools. Uh, the math proficiency is at the bottom. So I was wrong. Uh, it's worse, it's much worse than I thought. Reading proficiency is also in the bottom 50%, but I mean, when you're pushing wokeness and DEI and you're in this culture war, um, I think that your priorities need to be the education of the children in this district, seeing as parents trust you with their children. That is, you are trusted members of this society and this community with people's kids. That's their children. That is their, the beings that come out of their bodies. And after the last meeting, I could not look at my son and honestly say, I feel safe with you in mentor schools. So he was pulled out the next day. Thank God, because I will teach my son, like I did my oldest, when you're involved with something and you're at that appropriate age that I know you're mature enough because teachers don't get to spend all day with you. They don't get to spend 24-7, 365 with you. I do. I'll teach you about consent because I'm not a scumbag parent. I'll teach you about being safe and being a productive member of society because looking at a school ain't the place. Because we're more worried about looking inclusive to the tiny shred of people that need help rather than aff affirmation. They need help. No child has been born in the wrong body. And when anybody can look at me and say, we have to focus on our LGBTQ youth, Youth, you just associated sexuality with youth, with children, and that is pedophilia. I don't care what anybody says. Sex and kids are like oil and water. And unless you want to see me at every meeting, you're going to get those books out of here because I will be here every time for your whole four years. Yeah, I will, Miss Marchaza. No, Please no. address the president and keep your items to agenda items.
Our next speaker is David Lima from 7774 Litchfield Drive. Board President uh, Cook, board members, Mr. Heath, Mr. Wade, the meaning of public education is an equal education provided to all children free of cost regardless of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or any other distinguishing feature. This includes gifted students, students with disabilities and special needs, students who identify as LBGTQ, and groups of students with any other distinguishing feature. Public education serves as an equalizer, providing opportunities for students from all backgrounds to receive a quality education. It ensures that no child is denied access to learning. Our state legislature appears to be bent on establishing a two-tier public-private hybrid education system in Ohio through the constant expansion of the voucher system. Recent estimates that state spending on private school scholarships will reach and likely exceed $1 billion. Much of this money will benefit wealthier families due to the removal of income caps, allowing families of all incomes to receive scholarships. The voucher system, if it must exist, should not in any way negatively impact the financing of the public system. Because funding of public and private schools share the same budget line in the state budget, and with the expansion of the voucher system, there will be likely less money for public schools. The fair school funding plan, viewed as a panacea for the public system, will when fully adopted and funded, likely result in a reduction of state support for the mentor school system. Mr. Wade's description of the financial dilemma facing mentor schools along with the implementation of the fair school funding plan will result in mentor schools requiring additional funding. Support of local funding will be critical in avoiding this perilous trajectory. Political ideological ideas and issues and religious beliefs can often obscure the main purpose of public education, namely to provide all students of all backgrounds with a quality education. As things stand now, it appears the responsibility for funding mentor public education will rest with us, the voters of the mentor school district. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ann Fiorelli, 7570 Manry Court. Thank you, members of the board, Mr. Heath and Mr. Wade. This is in regards to the library materials discussion on the agenda for later tonight. As we all know, the topic of book appropriateness has taken center stage for quite a while now. This topic has been cast in a negative light by some in the community and even by the media. However, I believe it is a worthy discussion to give careful consideration to what we put in students' minds and hearts while they are young. I don't believe this needs to be a contentious topic. Just as it is not contentious when we talk about tailoring other aspects of education to each child's needs. I would like to see the focus shift away from what we don't want our kids to read to what we do want to encourage in the mentor schools. Quality above controversy, as well as a balanced, well-rounded offering. My oldest has been frustrated for quite some time with the book selections at her school. She's a voracious reader and has been pretty bored with what she has been able to find on the shelves. When she brings home what seems like the 100th installment of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Captain Underpants, or Stick Dog series, I have asked her many times, don't you have any classics at your school, like Narnia or Little House on the Prairie? I wonder if, to compete with TV, iPads, and video games for the attention of our kids, the book selections have become largely, largely irreverent humor style books full of complaining about parents and teachers, toilet humor, and the like. 
Our family would personally love to see more thought-provoking, imagination-stoking books coming home in their backpacks, the kind you cherish forever, not bubblegum for the brain books such as those series. My understanding is that book donations are allowable under board policy 7230 with board approval. So in the spirit of adding to the quality and the balance of the Mentor School's library offering, I would like to donate a full set of the Tuttle Twins series by Connor Boyack to the Bellflower Library. The purchase price is $105. My daughter has really enjoyed her set of these books. They are fun and quick reads and deal with topics such as the golden rule, the law, and personal responsibility. I will follow up with an email to formally offer this donation, and I look forward to the board's response. Perhaps if every family donated a few really great books that put quality above controversy, then our community could be proud of our school libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Bliss, 5421 Liberty Street. Good evening. As was stated earlier, this week is National Library Appreciation Week, with today being National Library Workers Day. As such, I can think of few things more appropriate for discussion than our district's library policy. The topic of how to best approach the community's concerns regarding library materials has been a subject of debate, debate at several meetings over the last couple of years, and it is clear that there is a compromise that must be made. I feel that the proposed multi-tiered policy is the compromise that we need. Going into next year, all parents will receive an email anytime their student checks out an item from a school media center. The proposed policy would add a layer of protection for parents who want it by preventing the student from checking out a library book until the parent approves the selection without infringing upon the rights of parents who prefer their students to have full access to all the materials our media centers have to offer. The new policy also addresses the time gap mentioned by another parent in which the email notifications were not received until well after the school had checked, until well after the student had checked out the books and had returned home from school. I feel that this policy is ideal as it protects the interests of all students and families. It also avoids the logistical nightmare and possible legal problems stemming from flagging individual books for content or removing the books altogether. I appreciate Mrs. Iopolo's concern for the feelings of the younger students who wouldn't be able to leave the library with a book until their parent approved it, as the younger kids would be most heavily affected by the policy. Mr. Heath's suggestion that the students pre-pick their book a week in advance is a smart way to address that concern, and I look forward to seeing how administration updates their guidelines to ensure that the policy is applied, applied and enforced across all grade levels. I'm also looking forward to seeing the board formulate this policy, partly because I'm a big nerd who finds policy language really interesting, but mainly because watching this board work together toward a common goal is truly enjoyable. The times that I've been able to see you all united working on policies that will have a positive impact on all students have been a clear showing that when this board operates as one, you can truly accomplish great things for our truly great district. I sincerely thank you all for all that you do. Thank you. Susan Sednick, 7539 Little Mountain Road. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Susan Sednick. I live on 7539 Little Mountain Road in Menor. Um, I just have a few items that I wanted to talk about. Uh, one, again, is um, the offerings in the school library. Again, I will just say I, I think that we owe it to our students to offer the best of the best. And without having controversial or pornographic material, um, as these are minors and students, that's what we should be doing. But since there is such an interest in inappropriate things and gender identity, I'm going to suggest some books for uh, the classroom. This is called Johnny the Walrus. It's a well-respected, well-known author who makes a case about 
um, the transgender um, fad, if you will, or craze. Anyway, it's a good, good book, good um, discussion for young kids. Um, this one, since there's a lot of folks that are interested in banned books, this one here is When Harry Became Sally. This was banned from Amazon. I'm um, not really sure why, because there's a lot of scientific facts, and it's an interesting read, but it does pre present the opposite viewpoint. And so um, I know that there's been talk of we should have um, a balance of viewpoints. And so I think Johnny the Walrus and When Harry Became Sally are good selections that we should include. I'm happy to purchase and donate if you'd like. Um, the other item I wanted to talk about was um, the possibility that the time for the community to speak at these board meetings would be um, severely cut back or eliminated. I don't really know that there was just this um, rumor going around. I don't know if that's true. I will say I think it goes against your policy or your philosophy where it says the board declares and therefore reaffirms its intent to maintain a two-way communication, blah, 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 and citizens shall be urged to bring their aspirations and concerns about the district to the attention of this body. Um, also that the board will act as a truly representative body for citizens in all matters related to programs and operations. And I would just ask that you please do not cut back on us speaking. I know that last month with a five hour meeting was extreme and we're tired, but I think it gives the community the impression that you're being punitive of I'm too tired to listen to the things that I don't want to. And I think we do have concerns. They may not be, um, my top of the list is not busing in classroom size. That doesn't mean they're not important, but there's other things that I think are more important. And so do other people and we should have the right to be able to speak and talk about that. I also wanted to say I'm disappointed that Nearpod is coming up for renewal. I wish you wouldn't. Um, also, the day of no silence, I was wondering, I asked Mr. Heath if you guys are going to be celebrating that at school, and I'm just waiting for a response. Thank you. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for school. All right. Yeah, I emailed you back. Our final speaker is John Sanford, 7537 Park Drive. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Mr. Heath, Mr. Wade. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I started out by passing out the references for what I'm going to be saying today. I would like to initiate, at least invite the rest of the speakers and, and the board in particular to initiate the practice. If you're going to say a statement of fact, provide documentation. And documentation that goes a little far beyond, further beyond than what was given last meeting, uh, such as Psychology Today, which was a reference that we've gotten an absolute F in the classes that I used to teach. So, you know, we, we use scientific evidence. So there they are. You can cite those as you, or look at those as you will. I wanted to speak to the uh, policy that's coming up at 7440.02, handheld metal, metal wanding. Um, we all know that the best response, and it's been recommended by the people who have gone through some horrific shootings, that we should have single access entry with universal screening for all of our activities. Unfortunately, that levy failed, so we can't even begin to look at that kind of stuff. That's what happens when politics get in the way of, of what's good for the schools. Um, however, so what we need to do then is to look at good assessment strategies. And that's a tough choice. I know in the board policy that you're looking at, the idea that uh, you have to identify somebody of concern. That kind of threat assessment it leaves you wide open to all kinds of accusations of prejudice and uh, discrimination. So you're going to need to have uh, some good practices, some good training. I know it says that people be trained. I mentioned and I gave you the reference for uh, comprehensive school threat assessment guidelines developed out of Virginia after their horrific shooting. Um, and I would invite you to be sure and look at those as guidelines for when are we going to choose to screen somebody. The other thing I notice is that you didn't have anything in there about screening the adults. And one of the things that we know is the more deadly shootings have been by former students, students of people who are no longer students who are now adults. Again, that's in the, in the references I gave you. So we're going to want to really, I think, look at if you're going to 
screen people, you need to screen everybody, including the adults that come in, because they're actually more likely to engage in the war shootings. I threw on there a last couple of references for us to invite you to re-examine some of your current practices. Uh, the active shooter debt guidelines, there's that re research that says, some research says yes, and some research says no, it's effective. But the bottom line is, the research is showing that the active shooter guidelines are traumatizing for our children rather than teaching them that they, what they need to know. Likewise, the school resource officers, uh, the research has shown that, uh, not, the causation is not there, but that resource officers are associated with higher death rates in some of the shootings. So it's just something to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the superintendent's report and recommendations. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just a couple of updates for everybody before we jump into the uh, consent agenda today. Uh, first of all, uh, a quick update on the cell phone policy. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll kind of give a, a quick update each uh, month until we get to uh, the end of the school year here. Um, the, the cell phone policy implementations uh, continue to go very well over the last month. Uh, I'm seeing very few, if any, disciplinary issues regarding the use of cell phones. Um, we will get some uh, data with that uh, for our May meeting, um, and then we'll also be finalizing some of that language adjustment um, that will be needed uh, for that policy moving forward just to make sure that we align at our middle school and elementary school levels. Uh, what, one item of note, though, um, we've seen an increase in profanity and verbal abuse behavior toward our staff as they've been trying to enforce the dress code more consistently, especially at the high school here recently. Uh, students are receiving consequences uh, up to suspensions for the profanity and the verbal abuse violations as we try to curb that type of behavior in our schools. I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Pastor Mike and Pastor Steve from uh, Grace Church of Menor uh, for organizing a group of volunteers who helped clean up areas around several of our school buildings yesterday after the solar eclipse. Their hard work definitely saved our grounds crew some time here this morning. Uh, one other update uh, that uh, we had promised as well regarding staffing and class sizes. Uh, we've continued to have our staffing meetings over the last month, and we've been looking closely at our enrollment numbers and our projections as we monitor our class sizes for the 24-25 school year. Uh, last year at this time, uh, we had uh, around four or five sections at different grade levels in our elementary schools that we had identified as, as like hot spots where class sizes were a little concerning. Uh, we were able to shift our staffing plan to address the majority of those at the beginning of this school year. Uh, this year, we are actually in very good shape in regards to our class sizes at this point in the process. Uh, we're currently sitting at the following class size averages for our elementary sections. In grade one, it's 21.1. Grade two is 21.4. Grade three is 20.8. Grade four is 22.7, and grade five is 23.5. Um, so wanted to give those, uh, those class size averages for, uh, for our board uh, consideration here this evening. We're gonna continue to, to update these numbers, and then uh, we'll provide some additional data on kindergarten, middle school, and high school averages at our um, May meeting as well. Our kindergarten numbers that continue to to come in, uh, they're very slow. If you want the exact number right now, I think the class size is 8.6, but <laughs> we only have about 200 students registered at this point. So that'll continue to come through. Um, this, uh, this Thursday, several surveys will be sent out to students, parents, staff members, and community and business partners as part of our strategic planning process. The first survey will be from the Learner Centered Collaborative, who is serving as our facilitators for the entire process. These surveys will be tailored to the specific group and are relatively short surveys to capture broad themes around what our students should know and be able to do prior to graduation. 
The second survey will hopefully be ready to go by the end of the week as well. If not, it might be next week, uh, depending on how quickly we can get this turned around. Uh, this is the comprehensive community survey that will be sent out to our staff members and our parents, and then will be made available to our community members through a variety of platforms as well. This is the one being conducted by Triad Research and will be uh, used by our guiding co coalition as part of our strategic plan and by our board and administrative team as we continue to make decisions in the best interest of all students based on data and community input. Our work will begin in, er in earnest here next week uh, when the learner-centered collaborative uh, facilitators will be in our district for two discovery days of interviews, classroom visits, and small group meetings with stakeholders from around the district and within our community. The data collected from the surveys and the discovery days will be used when our guiding coalition meets in person on May 2nd and May 15th to start working on the portrait of a learner, the goals and action steps of the strategic plan itself, and ultimately on the scorecard of measurable outcomes that we will use to determine the effectiveness of our plan. Um, here's how I'm in, I, I mentioned this in our board update last week, but here's how I'm thinking uh, about approaching this work with our board member involvement. Um, I would like to create a strategic plan administrative committee with two board members serving as the liaison, similar to what we have with our uh, school safety and the curriculum liaison committees. Um, based on work schedules and vacation schedules, um, I, I would like to maybe recommend Ms. Jessling and Mrs. Iapolo as uh, the serving on that guiding coalition team um, since we have the May 2nd and May 15th full days. Um, if that's agreeable to everybody on the board, I would like to um, have those two serve in that capacity. Um, um, I believe we're starting around nine o'clock-ish and probably should be done by around three-ish those days. Um, we will confirm that a little bit more when uh, we have our next meeting with the facilitators here, but um, uh, just would like the, those two members to be involved in that guiding coalition if that's agreeable. Um, the other part then, and, and we'll kind of sort this out here at, uh, towards the end of this week, is I, I want all five of you to be involved in some of the discovery day activities that we have um, on the, especially on Thursday, April 18th. And I can share some specific uh, times during that day. I know again, with, with work obligations, it may be a little bit challenging. Um, one of the meetings would be from uh, eight to 8.45 with the district administrative team, first thing in the morning. There's another meeting that would be from 12 to 12.30 that is involving our uh, entire principal group. And then the final one is from 5.30 to 6.30 um, for our community forum group as well. So if we could have like maybe one in the first thing in the morning, have two of you at the, the lunchtime one, and then maybe two others at the um, one in the evening, that would be kind of, a, a nice breakdown so that everybody gets an opportunity to um, to hear a little bit about uh, the conversations um, with those different groups. And again, all of that information is then going to come to our guiding coalition group on, on May 2nd. Um, so that's that's our preliminary step towards uh, getting the board involvement in the, in the plan. Um, but uh, we will also have other opportunities um, throughout this these next couple of months for you guys to be involved in uh, in some of the activities, some of the writing, uh, some of the review of the, the data as well. So um, we'll try and maybe coordinate mm -hmm. times um, here in the next couple of days. So I might reach out individually to, to get those set up, um, but just as an FYI, so you get, can start taking a look at your own respective calendars, because I know that's a lot of time there. Uh, I also want to thank um, so are we good with uh, mm -hmm. Rose and Jenny? You guys good? Mm -hmm. Everybody else okay with that? All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would also like to thank those uh, that have agreed to be part of the process. Um, I know we've sent out a lot of uh, requests uh, to be part of not only our guiding coalition, but also our uh, Discovery Day um, activities in some of our meetings there. So I know we've gotten a lot of resp positive response with that. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, 
those ideas, that feedback, that collaboration as we go through this process here. Final thing that I have, um, had an opportunity here at the end of the school day today. Um, I was able to join Mr. Porter uh, over at Sterling Morton Elementary School uh, for a su uh, surprise assembly to announce that they have won the 2024 Ohio Association of Elementary School Administrators Hall of Fame Award. <laughs> Um, each year, uh, OAESA recognizes elementary and middle schools that provide outstanding educational opportunities to their students through effective programming and instruction. Uh, these schools are characterized by an atmosphere of growth, achievement, pride, and dedication to excellence on the part of staff and students. Uh, we are so excited uh, to be able to celebrate this award uh, with such an amazing collection of students and staff at Morton. Um, we had a, a, a really good assembly over there today. Um, the kids were really excited. The staff members were completely surprised because it was <laughs> kept a secret until the assembly itself. Um, they even invited Mrs. Sturmbeck, uh, who was the principal at, uh, at Sterling Morton, um, because she was a, played a big role in the success that those students are seeing over there right now. Um, we will have them uh, here to be recognized at our May board meeting as well, but I did want to make that announcement here this evening because that is such a great honor. With that, Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade, I have the following recommendations listed under, listed under the consent agenda and recommend approval of items 6A1 through 6A4. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I had a couple um, comments and then a question. So on uh, the Mentor Schools Foundation, last month I abstained from that vote because I was included in that conversation. Although I'm not a, a voting board member um, of that group, it's still because of our bylaws that state we should abs you know, abstain if there's an appearance of a conflict of interest. Um, tonight I will be voting on that because I wasn't included in those discussions um, that we're voting on. So that's just the first note. Uh, second thing under four, the payment in lieu of transportation. I just had a couple other questions. Um, I know this is just a one-off, it looks like, just one, one student in addition. Um, and Mr. Wade, I don't know if you could answer this for me. When I had asked you in November, you said that it was done once per year. Is that correct? Uh, now the new law states that we have a uh, limit. If a new student comes in, we have a certain number of days. I believe it's 14, uh, but don't quote me on that because um, it's still new, that we have to make a decision on practicality and we have to let everybody know. Okay, and then do you know how much, I know when I had emailed you in November, you said 75,000 was how much we were paying out for the last time we paid out everything. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much it is for just one, like per child? I wouldn't feel comfortable stating it at the table without having <laughs> looking it up. Around confirmed. like 600? I, I was going to say 500 was my gut, but I okay. can confirm and update everybody in my Friday update. Okay. Um, so that's just another, I mean, I think this is just a one-off, uh, but I think it is something that we need to be cognizant of if there are additional people that are going to leave our district and go to private schools um, that are outside of us busing them. It's just another, you know, number that we need to kind of just keep data on and, and trends on. So that's all I had. Any more discussion? Okay, Mr. Wade, please call the roll. Ms. Jessling? Yes. Ms. Marchaza? Yes. Ms. Diavolo? Yes. Ms. Payne? Yes. Ms. Cook? Yes. Motions carry 5 0. Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the Guardian Acquisition Reimbursement Agreement. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Wade, please call the roll. Ms. Payne? Yes. Ms. Jessling? Yes. Ms. Ayapolo? Yes. Ms. Marchaza? Yes. Ms. Cook? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the renewal addendum one to the administrative services agreement with Medical Mutual. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Ayapolo? Yes. Ms. Jessling? Yes. Ms. Marchaza? Yes. Ms. Payne? Yes. Ms. Cook? Yes. Motion carries 
Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the stop loss contract rider with Medical Mutual. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the roll. Ms. Chesling. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Ayapolo. Yes. Ms. Morchaza. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the Nearpod annual renewal. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to state, I know this came up last year, and I remember sitting on the other side when that came up. Um, and I know all the benefits that it has, and we've used it for a while. Um, there are just, I know there's some other aspects of it um, that would be up for debate, whether it's indoctrination, um, age appropriate, things like that. Um, I prefer that we could maybe look into some options. I know that the uh, contract doesn't begin until August, so if that's something, I know there's a lot of other um, um, content that we can use that are comparable to Nearpod, and since we've used it for so long, it might make sense to want to look into some other things. Um, you know, I it's based on um, some of the castle. Is that how you say it? Um, castle, castle. The um, kind of it's. It, some people believe that it creates. It focuses too much on our children's issues and anxiety and fear and problems, and leads to a victim mentality. And I think in this tough world, we need to. We need to build strong and mentally tough students. So I would be interested in looking, um, since we have some time, into other options. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there. I, I would echo um, Rose's comments. Last year, I voted no uh, because of the political ideology that Nearpod does include, which a lot of um, people do feel like is too um, is inappropriate and they don't want their tax dollars going towards political ideology, and I can empathize with that. Um, so I would state, I mean, I would definitely support looking into a different program, especially knowing the um, perception that some of the community does already have about political ideology and being cognizant of that and what we're using taxpayer dollars for. So I would absolutely support looking into a different, different company, and if it's not until August, that would, that would give us some time to kind of delve in deeper. Any other discussion? Postpone? Yeah, I'll motion to postpone. I'll second it. Uh, postpone to a later date, to a later right? Date, yeah. Not indefinitely. Do you have a date in mind? Um, Ask, I guess Mr. Heath and Mr. Lynch, do you guys know how long it would take to kind of <laughs> research other options? Um, it would depend on that. Yeah, it may take some time to actually vet other resources. Um, so that, again, something that could be done. Have you looked at other things in the past? When, when you decided on Nearpod, was there um, a vetting process in place and you looked at other things or did you only look at Nearpod? Yeah, because that, that first came on back in 2015 when uh, we moved to the one-to-one -one devices and, and a lot of it's revolving just around the digital citizenship curriculum. Um, this also allows teachers to kind of create their own interactive lessons um, and that's that's how it's been used. A lot of the, the things that have been developed by Nearpod over time have been this additional library of resources that our teachers that they have access to, but they're they're not allowed technically not allowed to use them unless they align to our content standards mm -hmm. um, in the health curriculum. Um, we haven't been using those those items. If they do go through the process and there's something that does align, they could potentially pull something out of there. Um, students don't have access within Nearpod. Um, it's just the, the teachers that uh, mm -hmm. would have to share an access uh, code with them in order for them to actually tap into it. So, um, so that's how it's been used in the past. Um, we'd have to we'd take some time to, to dig through and, and vet some of these uh, items that uh, would meet the same criteria that we have on a Nearpod with the digital citizenship. So to clarify, the students don't have free reign, the teachers are using their judgment, and then if there was something that was controversial, what 
would they, what, that is would there go a procedure our, they have to follow? That would go through our controversial issues policy, mm -hmm. which again, with our uh, administrative guidelines, you know, we're putting together for our teachers now, those, they're gonna have to be vetted before anything would actually be put in front of the students. Um, and again, anything that they, they pull has to be aligned with what it is that uh, we've got in our learning standards mm -hmm. for health. I think um, to Mrs. Cook's point, uh, I, don't, I don't think Rose or I are saying that teachers are gonna pull it and all that information, but it goes back down to the principle of using public tax dollars for um, a company or purchasing you know, a contract with a company that has some pretty heavy political ideology. And, and so I voted on no on OSBA. I voted no on this before. I would like to look into a different option. I'd rather have you know, full support of the board especially for the perception of the community, um, I think it would be in our best interest to look for a different organization, different company where we can get the same thing, but they don't have that heavy political uh, ideology. Mrs. Payne, can you point to some specific um, things that you saw in Nearpod that oh, yeah. you found problematic? Yep, so they have, um, let me pull it up. Pride LGBTQ lessons and racial justice pro, um, resource guides. And as we've seen, I mean, some has pretty heavy CRT baselines of uh, white privilege, things like that. And if we go back to better lessons, which we had that issue several years ago, and we decided to stop our contract with better lessons because of the heavy political ideology, like is mentioned in this, um, it's just not something that is universally accepted or supported. So I don't think we should be using public tax dollars for that. Just like. When I asked for my training, I don't know, it was a couple years ago, <laughs> and it was a $40 training that I wanted to go to, but I know Ms. Cook and Ms. Jeshling felt like it was too politically charged, and so they voted no, that's their right to do that, I paid for it out of pocket. But under those same guidelines then, we would be hypocrites if we were to support an organization with, I don't know, $35,000. <laughs> Um, can we look and you know talk to our staff and find out what I mean? That's a long time to have one to, to do near you know to have Nearpod one system whatever. Is there something that they can recommend? I know I, whenever I'm in a teacher's lounge, they're always talking about the latest and greatest and newest stuff. So this could be a good opportunity to find something new. So Nearpod is used for digital citizenship currently. Yeah, and then allowing the, it's a tool that teachers can use to create their uh, interactive lessons. Is there a problem with any of the digital citizenship lessons? Um, I, I honestly don't care. <laughs> My point is that we shouldn't be using public tax dollars for an organization that has a heavy political ideology push, especially for teachers. If we're trying to present to the community as one unified front that we are not pushing political ideology, then we should not be using public, public tax dollars to support an organization that pushes yeah. political ideology. I think where, excuse me, excuse me, thank you. I think where it gets tricky is, first, well, first of all, I want to acknowledge what Mr. Heath said, which was that um, we have policy set up to deal with controversial issues. So we do have a bit of a, excuse me, a bit of a um, firewall, so to speak, to, um, to work through before any of that should reach teachers and even especially students. So I think the other thing that I see is sort of um, subjective, right? I mean, I, I would say I don't agree that talking about LGBTQ people is a political ideology. So again, I feel like we've come to the same point in conversation before where it's subjective, right? It's not an objective thing. We can't objectively all say that we all agree this is a one thing or another thing, you know, so that gets, that gets tricky. I, would, I agree with you. I don't yeah. think that anybody's saying it's one way or the other. I think based on our previous board meetings, we can say that it is an area of controversy. I'm not even saying which side I'm on, but I'm saying it's... Wait, I'm, but you did, though. You said, because you said you voted against it. So, oh, absolutely. Excuse I, me. I did vote against it because of the... I'm sorry. This is a public meeting for the board to do business. And if you're going to be disruptive, you're going to need to leave. So I did vote against it because of the principle, like I mentioned earlier, just like they voted against my $40 training because they felt like it was too heavily politically charged. Well, I'm stating, stating under those same guidelines, I can't support this. So 
what harm is there in looking at a different organization that all of us could get behind to put on that unified front to the community so that we can say, hey, look it, we all came together. This, we all found something different. We came to a compromise. We're not going to do that or company. Well, I guess the only response would be that that would then create uh, additional work to dive into more resources, additional time of staff and, and their attention, and um, that they would have to then dedicate to, to diving into something different when we've had something that seems to be, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Heath, but working quite well. So I, I don't know. It seems like it it's fixing a problem that isn't there for me, for me. I understand what you're saying, but the problem to me, being on the board for two and a half years, hearing public commentary every month, it is a problem. And when we're looking at putting on a levy on the ballot in the you know, near future, we're gonna need buy-in from the vast majority of our community members. So having something like this, which is so easy to go look at different options, at least to look through the different options to see if there's something that isn't politically charged or controversy, controversial, um, I think it would be worth that time. I see your point. I, I also would say that we don't know that the vast majority of the public here in men are voting public, we should say, would agree. You know, so I, that's what I'm saying. It's, again, it's a subjective thing, and, and yeah. so I it's hard to speak for the entire community when we, we certainly don't have them here tonight. And that's a straw man fallacy, because I didn't say that. I said that oh, we I misunderstood need, then. We need the majority of a broad base of supporters to support us when we go and ask them for money for a levy. Because you mm -hmm. need a majority to pass a levy. Okay. That's what I was saying. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is there any more discussion about postponing the vote? Okay, so we have a motion on the table to postpone the vote. Would you call the roll? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that we had a guess time. I it, it would be, depend on how much time you think is needed. And we have till I think, mid-August. So with the time, are you looking at an alternate, or are you just looking for, are there other options? One and the same, right? Mm -hmm. Looking for other options to see if there's something better, and then we can bring that. I don't know how long, it, how much time they need to go through. I don't know what that process is like. So if it could be done by the next, you know, next meeting, but I mean, it's not up till August, so why rush it? So if we want to even postpone it till June. Is the renewal now? with implementation in August, or we're approving implementation in August with payment in August, because it's on our agenda now. <coughs> Is this the, the deadline for making a selection for the fall? That's how I understood it. Is that right, Mr. Lynch? The is the approval of the contract just allows us to write the requisition of the PO for it to be paid in August, so there's a seamless transition. So the other issue would be timing for a transition. So if an alternate source was identified in order, because we're using the, the um, digital citizenship throughout the year, I believe that those units are taught K through mm -hmm. K through eight for the digital citizen, K through three. <laughs> K through 12, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you needed more fingers. <laughs> um, so K through 12 digital citizenship, to put that in place, that's a, a separate discussion. Would you feel comfortable, we could postpone for whatever, let's say, until July, the July meeting, <coughs> postpone if there were something identified that they thought was of qu comparable quality and could be implemented seamlessly, then that, that might be the recommendation. Or that we could alternatively then, if that wasn't available, approve Nearpod for this year and have more time. <coughs> Does that seem like? I Personally, I can't support Nearpod. I don't know. Yeah, I agree, but I, you know, let's, can we cross that bridge? And see how I mean. There's there's a lot out there, and nine years using the same one is a long time. I know we, we change up some, much more frequently in, in other respects. So, and this wasn't in in. We want to hear from the expert. I was going to say this wasn't this platform wasn't in the original contract. We've had this forever, and they, that was more recent. There's there's one point that I just would like to add, is that. Um, we have a district technology steering committee that meets monthly. 
And when we were looking at programs, we look at all of our programs on a yearly basis. When we were looking, we're always looking to reduce the number of programs we have to be fiscally responsible as a district. Nearpod, which is primarily used for the purpose of adding interactions for um, presentations that teachers already have. It allows kids to be on their Chromebooks, MacBooks, or iPads, and for the kids to interact with the presentation. That's primarily how Nearpod is used in our district, as well as the digital citizenship lessons. The other piece that Nearpod added this past year is a tool to be able to bring in a video and add in interactions. We have another program that we pay uh, $14,000 for called Play Posit. Our district steering committee made a decision at last month's um, steering committee meeting to remove Play Posit because we have Nearpod that now is doing has the ability to do the same thing that Play Posit did. So we were using that as a cost savings for the district as we're always trying to make sure we're not having a replication of programs. So I just wanted to add that element in. I don't like to have to come up, but I <laughs> felt like that had not been mentioned. That's helpful. I have one more question regarding that, Mr. Lynch. With, if you, um, because teachers are creating these interactive lessons, do they save them? Would they be, if we didn't have Nearpod, would they need to start again, or how we, is that? Within Nearpod, those lessons are interactive because of the tools within Nearpod. We have a district library that allows teachers to share that content amongst each other. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we have like a third grade folder that third grade teachers could access a presentation and share that interactive presentation. So those are stored in our district library. If we don't have the program, we obviously would lose any of those presentations that were made within Nearpod um, as, as just because they were made with their, um, okay. their interactive tool. So, um, thank you. You're welcome. When I think about creating content mm -hmm. and the tools <laughs> <laughs> that you use to have things that you've invested time in, to have that inactivated because mm -hmm. we're not using that subscription, that would be immensely frustrating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, the way I'm understanding it, Nearpod mm -hmm. would work like part of the office suite. You got this aspect like a, I don't know, PowerPoint or whatever, and that you could create content and have it function in a predictable way. If you have something that utilizes that software or that, however their arrangement is, that content then goes away, that would that would be a significant frustration for most teachers mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. of the time that any of that takes. And you know, you write your lesson plans and you refer to something that you've developed and you've tailored it to your your class, the tools that you have, that would be a big loss. And and I appreciate what you're saying, that a company may sell a wide array of products any kind of a company. But if we're using these pieces in a way that certainly doesn't stray into an area of controversy, it's for the digital citizenship, which we've all agreed for some time is very important for our students to have. It's K through 12. And then you have these other tools that let you create content for instructional use. To blow that up, would be very frustrating. And I'm not saying that there isn't something else out there, but I would be reluctant to make this go away until we had confidence that there was something better. And I, I'm glad you reminded us, Mr. Lynch, of the technology committee that's working. I mean, that's their, their primary focus is streamlining products. You know, we're paying for licenses for anything, you know. So efficiencies and all of that and not having redundant capabilities would be something that they're focused on. So I 
guess based on that, I, I would be happy, and I'm thinking that that committee is already aware. You know, everybody gets ads all day long on their email for something bigger, better, faster, stronger, that they're, you know, paying attention to that because, like anything, a company can go out of business, and then, you know, you're back to square one. But if we have something that's functioning well, and we're using it in a responsible way that doesn't stray into those areas of controversy. Mm -hmm. Just because the company has other products that we don't use. The, the other products that we don't use, though, are included in our contract. So we don't use them, but they are included in what we're paying. We just, our policies safeguard us from using that because it should align with our you know, standards and the controversial issues mm -hmm. policy and all of that. So I, I would still like to look into. Yeah. We might be able to find something that, that yeah. is, we can cherry pick what we, and only pay for what we're using right. versus maybe right. paying a larger sum for something we don't, we aren't using. And I'd love to hear what teachers, you know, what ideas they have. Um, again, they, they, they have, a lot of times they don't have a choice. And so maybe that they, we, we can put some feelers out there and see. See what they like. So, I mean, I, I, I'm willing to say June if that's a, enough time, or unless you want to go July. But you know, it doesn't hurt to look into it. So, your motion is postponed till June, till the, the June, June meeting. regular meeting. I second it. Okay, please call the roll. Avalo. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. No. Ms. Cook. No. Motion carries to postpone until June with a 3 2 vote. Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the engagement with uh, Ohio Auditor of State to prepare financial statements. So moved. Second. Is that Ms. Payne that moved? Yep. It was. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Iapolo. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the Power School Annual Agreement. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Iapolo. Yes. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the resolution authorizing participation in the Ohio Department of Transportation Cooperative Purchasing Program. So moved. Second. Uh, Lauren. Rose. No, it wasn't. Rose. Oh, Rose. Rose, sorry. I can't be done. I gotta be in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> like my ears aren't good. Enough. And then that was Ms. Mrs. Jessling was you. the second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Iapolo. Yes. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the resolution ranking the firms that responded to the district's request for qualifications and authorizing the treasurer to enter into contract negotiations. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Iapolo. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Ocean carries 5-0. Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of the resolution accepting the Shore Middle School Pavement Improvement Bid. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Thank you to Mr. Wade for getting it in under budget. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> oh, that was Mr. Vaccarello and Mr. Kolar and their team. I, <laughs> I just get the pleasure of uh, Tell them to we, the team. We send our thanks. <laughs> Please call the roll. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Iapolo. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Madam President, members of the board, and Mr. Wade, I'm recommending approval of agenda item C1 related to certified personnel and C2 through C4, all related to human resource matters. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Payne. 
Yes. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Apollo. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motions carry 5-0. I'm also recommending approval of agenda item D related to administrative staff. So moved. Second. Second. I'm going to give that one to Ms. Uh, <laughs> I louder. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Iapolo. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. This concludes my portion of tonight's agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the Board of Education report and recommendations. The first item under board business is the first reading of the Mentor Board of Education NEOLA policies. And because this is a first reading, no vote is necessary. Is there any discussion? I did have um, discussion. I, just a real quick. It talks about feminine products and, and having those available for free for our students, which I know, um, I think it was all of us actually mm -hmm. that went to uh, mm -hmm. and, and heard from the students in the US history class, the AP class, and the students were presenting what they would like to change. And one of the things that <laughs> several of them mentioned was that we don't have feminine products in the actual bathrooms. And I had emailed Mr. Heath and I think Mr. Crow, but I haven't heard back yet. So I don't know, because I'm, I'm a woman and I would like those in the bathroom <laughs> because I think it's important. Our students were like, we don't want to go to the nurse's office to get one of those things. So yeah, and, and again, uh, that came out of one of the state laws that was passed here recently as well. And, and while we're meeting compliance because they are available in the nurse's office for free, at, it, especially at the elementary middle school level, I know the concern from the operations department was oftentimes those things get uh, flushed down the toilet and cause some major headaches from clogs and those sorts of things. That's why they were located there. Um, obviously, at the high school, we have dispensers uh, available in the restrooms themselves, but um, I know hearing from several members of the board, that's going to be another conversation we'll bring up um, with, uh, with operations just to figure out, you know, is there a better way that we can uh, have those things available um, in each of the, the restroom facilities so that um, they are available moving forward. And I know forward. Um, the student group brought up that there's a grant that we could get for the free products. Yes, yeah, so, we, uh, so Mr. Vaccarello actually um, uh, will keep track of all of the um, free products that uh, we've utilized, <laughs> and uh, there's a reimbursement okay. process. So um, he's completely on top of that as well. Okay. Thank you. That's yes. all I had. You're welcome. Okay, any more discussion? All right, do I have a motion? Don't need one. Oh, I'm sorry, this, or this, that was for the, for the first. For the first, for the first. first item. So I'm sorry, the there's no reading. vote on this one, sorry. <laughs> the second item under board business is the second reading and approval of the Manor Board of Education NEOLA policies. So moved. Second. second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, please call the roll. Ms. Chesley. Yes. Ms. Marchaza. Yes. Ms. Apollo. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. All right, now we have the student achievement report. Mrs. Jess. Oh, you skipped the legislative. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. What's I mean, if she me? wants to go first, she may. <laughs> Please, no. Legislative report. I'm just checking that. Thank them. you. Um, so, yes, we've got lots of updates. Uh, first, we'll start with the State Board and Department of Education and Workforce updates. Um, DEW had its first, or excuse me, had a public meeting in March to provide an update on literacy and to allow for public comment on some proposed rules. Um, Dr. Melissa Weber Mayer gave um, an update on the implementation of the Science of Reading program, which is fairly new, and many people have already heard of it. So really, um, you can view, actually, her presentation on the DEW website. The entire meeting, in fact, is viewable. Um, but basically, the status update that she gave was that instructional materials are being implemented across districts, and training and professional development will take place uh, for staff and teachers this summer. Um, they also have some proposed um, following, or excuse me, some proposed rules open for public comment, which you can go to their website and weigh in on yourself. Um, the State Board of Education also had a public meeting in March, um, and again, their meetings are also public, so you can go on to their website and read, or excuse me, view them at any time. 
Uh, the State House, turning to the State House and the General Assembly, the uh, legislature was in spring recess for quite some time following the March 19th primary election. Uh, they did resume this week. The House meets tomorrow, April 10th at 2 p.m., so we'll see some more action there. But um, during that session, we might actually see an amendment and a House vote on House Bill 183, uh, which would require all Ohio schools to segregate bathrooms, locker rooms, changing rooms, shower rooms, and overnight accommodations, quote, for the exclusive use of a single sex, end quote, and according to which sex is listed on a person's birth certificate. Phew. Um, so that might be uh, moving tomorrow, so we'll need to keep an eye on that one for sure. That will affect um, not only, uh, excuse me, that affects only K through 12 public community STEM and chartered non-public schools and education, educational service centers. Uh, there was a lot of new legislation that was introduced, especially on April 2nd. There were about a dozen bills that were introduced, so it was pretty busy. Um, Eleven of them have already moved into, have been referred to committee, so I'm just going to go over a few of those, not all of them. Um, House Bill 411, this one is to increase the base teacher salary to $50,000 a year. Um, House Bill 408, this one um, would require public schools to provide meals to students who need them regardless of their ability to pay and regardless of whether or not they have any outstanding meal debt. House Bill 445, this one would force all Ohio school districts to implement policies for released time coursework in religious instruction. Um, release time, if for, for those who don't know, means um, time during the school day uh, for religious instruction. Um, this really is a very simple proposal. It changes a single word in the current Ohio Revised Code from may to shall, so it's pretty simple. That one's moving pretty quickly, so we'll need to watch that one. Uh, mentor, just for the record, we don't have a release time policy. Is that correct? We did. We don't anymore. We don't any we longer. Are. Thank you. Um, House Bill 447. This one's a little complicated. It's got a lot of moving parts to it. It has to do um, with farmland and schools, believe it or not. But basically, what, it, what is relevant to us is that it would reduce school districts, uh, their, the 20 mil floor, making it harder. And again, we're not at the um, 20 mil floor. I know I've said that before. But it would make, for student, for, excuse me, for districts that are, it would make them harder, make it harder to meet that floor, meaning they're less likely to get to the point where they're collecting um, more property taxes. Um, this would be a permanent change. This, if this bill were to pass. So that's really a great example of something um, that the Joint Property Tax Review Committee would review and kind of understand any long-term impact that would have on district, districts throughout the state. Um, House Bill 462, um, this one proposed by our own Dan Troy. <laughs> I felt like I had to mention this one. Uh, this one would set up a grant program for students pursuing bachelor's degrees at public universities. So we'll keep an eye on those bills moving forward to see what happens. Uh, there were also committee meetings yesterday. Um, the Senate Education Committee met this afternoon. I, I think they were still meeting when I was able to last check, so I don't know what the outcomes were of that yet. I can tell you um, they, were, they had hearings for specific bills, uh, House Bill 147. This would make changes to teacher licensure revocation, teacher hiring practices, and conduct unbecoming to the teaching profession. This one had its second committee hearing today um, with proponent testimony only. Senate Bill 208 also had a hearing. This one would require, I've mentioned this one before, would require districts to include a military exception for open enrollment policies. Um, this was proponent testimony only heard today. House Bill 250, uh, we've also heard about this one. It would revise the military enlistment diploma seal. Uh, this one had a third hearing, all testimony from all parties. Sometimes they, they bunch them all together rather than doing, you know, sponsor, proponent, and opponent. This one had it all together today. Uh, the Primary and Secondary Education Committee also met this afternoon. One of the bills they heard about was new, and that was House Bill 432. Um, this one would actually be very relevant to us. This one uh, was regarding the teacher the teaching of career technical education. Um, it would require the state board to adopt rules establishing standards and requirements for obtaining a license under um, the section of the, um, let's see, of uh, let's see, F and G of section of part of the Ohio Revised Code, 3319.229. Um, so that would definitely affect our CTE programs. Um, this was sponsor testimony only since it's so new. And then Senate Bill 168 also had a hearing. This is its second committee hearing, proponent testimony only. This is the bill that would lower existing requirements for advanced educator licenses, 
remove mandatory state prescribed evaluation systems and expand schools' ability to employ unlicensed people as teachers. Um, so that's it for the committee hearings. Um, I, think, I think that's it. I think those are the highlights um, and we'll see what happens moving forward. End of report. I had a question, Mr. Heath, I don't know if you could answer this um, because of the House bill that you had mentioned, um, Ms. Matraza, about mm -hmm. I, I know about them turning May into shall, about the release. Oh, are you talking <clears throat> about 4.45? Oh, sorry, the release time, yeah. yeah. Um, and I had attended an OSBA course all about this. It was actually led by Pebble and Wagoner, who we used to have as a law firm as well. And there was some discussion about why these are moving so quickly, and it was because of a Supreme Court case that set precedent. So even though we don't have a policy, it doesn't mean that we would not be held to possibly allow it because of that Supreme Court precedent. So I just, Correct. That, okay, I just wanted to make sure that was my understanding after the OSBA course as well. Alrighty, it's time for student achievement, <laughs> my favorite part. Thank you, Mrs. Dustin. <laughs> A good education means providing many opportunities for students to explore, solve problems, and meet challenges. And while most of this occurs in the classroom, Mentor also offers a wide array of activities to support the development of well-rounded, successful students ready for their future success. And here is a sampling. For nearly 125 years, the College Board has developed and administered standardized advanced placement tests and curricula used to promote college readiness. AP offers undergraduate university level courses and examinations to high school students. Colleges in the US and elsewhere may grant placement and course credit to students who obtain qualifying scores on those exams. The AP curriculum for each of the various subjects is created for the College Board by a panel of experts and college-level educators in their academic disciplines. Every fall, the AP program recognizes high school students who have demonstrated outstanding achievement through their performance on multiple AP exams. The AP Scholar designation is granted to students who receive scores of three or higher on three or more AP exams, and the AP Capstone Diploma is granted to students who earn scores of three or higher in AP Seminar and AP Research and on four additional AP exams of their choosing. This year, we are thrilled to announce that 64 seniors are being recognized by the College Board as AP Scholars or AP Capstone Award winners. These students have collectively earned an average score of 3.54 on 275 AP exams during their 10th and 11th grade years. A fascinating Mentor Marsh study an examination of the effects of noise pollution on bird foraging behavior by Mentor High senior Robbie Land has been recognized as an award-winning research project. The Northeast Ohio Science and Engineering Fair at Cleveland State University awarded Robbie the grand prize, which includes an all-expense paid trip to Los Angeles to present his work at the International Science and Engineering Fair in May. He was also recognized by the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society and the Cleveland Clinic for his exceptional work. On March 21st, Mentor High School CTE students engage with preschoolers as part of their Little Leaders Code for Care event. Code for Care was created and organized by Mentor's Student-Led Skills USA Community Service Team. Members included Paxton Warren, Alexander Seifert, and Davion Davis. Mentor Skills USA chapter recently earned a gold level status from Skills USA Ohio, making it one of only 13 schools in the state to medal. At our March 5th athletic signing ceremony for D1 and D2 universities, eight Mentor High senior athletes signed their letters of intent to compete at the collegiate level. They were Melissa Bogovic, Annie Barrow, Nick Blackburn, Addison Lyles, Maddie Menchaca, Sydney Stark, Mackenzie Stuckert, and Tanner Toot. Congratulations. And we saw a couple of those athletes this evening, or heard about them at least. The Cleveland Council on World Affairs has promoted global education, citizen diplomacy, and public dialogue for a century now. Menor hosted the CCWA's Spring Junior Model United Nations Conference here at Paradigm last week. 
Middle school teams from across the region joined together for a great two-day simulation experience, and it was exciting to welcome so many schools to mentor. Both Memorial and Shore Junior Model UN teams have put their diplomacy skills to work debating with students from Northeast Ohio to resolve some of the world's most challenging global issues. For the past several years, our middle school students have been coached by our own men or high model UN mentors via mock conferences that they prepare for them to build experience and it shows. Middle schoolers can make a difference in our community. Make a Difference Day started in 2018 and has expanded to both Memorial and Shore. On March 22nd, over 500 eighth graders went into the community and gave back at a variety of locations, including our elementary schools, the Salvation Army, Edwin's Foundation, Restart, United Way, and many more. This event is a collaboration between the Mentor Middle Schools and over 40 local organizations, teaching our students the importance of service learning and giving back. It was a great day filled with compassion, empathy, and doing for others. Congratulations to this awesome <laughs> angling Men Around the Lake team. Sam Spataro, an eighth grader at Shore Middle, reeled in the catch of a lifetime at Menor Lagoons, a 45-inch northern pike. The Ohio State record is just 43 inches, weighing two, uh, 22 pounds and six ounces. Because he didn't want to harm the fish, <laughs> Sam let it go without weighing it for the record, and that level of caring for nature makes us all proud. <laughs> It's Autism Awareness Month, and we celebrate the CARES basketball team who wrapped up their season with a championship win against Wycliffe High School's varsity basketball team. Well done. The Ohio Music Education Association District 7 adjudicated contest for band and choir was held here at Mentor on March 15th and 16th. 46 ensembles from Oliver Lake, Geauga, and Cuyahoga counties participated. Menor was well represented with 13 performing ensembles. The band ratings were as follows. Menor High Wind Ensemble, Superior. Menor High School Scarlet Band, Excellent. Menor High School Freshman Concert Band, Excellent. And from the vocal end, the choir groups included Shore 7 and 8 Mixed Choir, Memorial 7 and 8 Mixed Choir, Menor High Bella Voce Chorus, Cantari Chorus, Concert Treble Choir, and Concert Mix Choir, and all six groups received a superior rating. The OMEA advocates for comprehensive music programs adhering to state and national music standards with regular assessments to ensure that students meet high academic expectations. And the District 7 Solo and Ensemble Contest will be held at Memorial Middle School this weekend. Menor Public Schools has been named a National Association of Music Merchants Best Community for Music Education Award winner. The program recognizes and celebrates outstanding efforts by teachers, administrators, parents, students, and community leaders who have made music education part of a well-rounded curriculum. Designations made to districts and schools that demonstrate an exceptionally high commitment and access to music education for all. Menor is one of 60 Ohio districts and one of less than 1,000 districts nationally to receive this designation. Memorial Middle School's theater production of Big Bad was a hit with audiences on Friday. The clever play was a fun take on the true story of the three little pigs with the wolf facing a courtroom trial. The mm -hmm. cast and crew clearly had a marvelous time and their energy was infectious. On Wednesday, April 3rd, Sterling Morton Elementary hosted a related arts showcase where PE, STEAM, music, and art were all featured for families and students from 5 to 7 p.m. Students had the opportunity to experience interactive displays, listen to or play music, and every child had a work of art on display. And Mr. Keith and I enjoyed that. <laughs> the Menor High School Theater Spring Musical will be the school edition of Stephen Sondheim's Sweeney Todd with performances April 18th through 21st. Get your tickets, they are going fast. Lake Elementary students are organized into four K through five houses to build school spirit and positive team attitudes. 
Men Around the Lakes Patrolman Kyphus spun the wheel at last week's assembly and became a member of Team Reviewer. He joins Patrolman Brzezinski representing the blue. I don't think that was an accident, but I won't <laughs> speak to that. The wonderful rapport between our district students and the men and women of the Men Around the Lake and Men Are Police Forces is deeply appreciated. Mark your calendars for the Mentor School's Fine Art Extravaganza, a twofer, on Tuesday, April 23rd, beginning with the annual elementary art show from 5 to 7.30 right here at Paradigm. And district-wide K-5 through artwork will be featured along with special, a special collaborative project you will not want to miss. In the five art, Fine Arts Center from 6 to 8 that same evening, treat yourself to Mentor High's Senior Artist Exhibition, Total Eclipse of the Heart. This pop-up event will feature a celestial aesthetic with multiple platforms offering physical and digital works that will light up the night. The portfolio's exhibit will show the culminating achievements of Mentor's senior art students. And in case you thought you'd get hungry, the food trucks will be stationed outside to offer refreshments, and the show promises to be out of this world. And finally, since 1987, Leadership Lake County has engaged present and future leaders to become committed to social, civic, and economic excellence right here in our community. Applications for the 2025 Junior Leadership Program for grades 10 through 12 and the Youth Leadership Academy for grades 7 and 8 are being accepted until May 2nd. The monthly program offers unique opportunities designed to guide students to reach their full leadership potential. And for more information, visit leadershiplakecounty.org. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Chief Financial Officer's report and recommendation. Follow that, Mr. Wade. <laughs> I'm going to be quick. I'm going to save my time for next month. <laughs> um, long story short, revenue is coming in a slight tad over what we projected uh, by 70,000. Expenses are down about 1.6 million, so we're looking to be about 1.7 better than we were projecting in the November forecast, which reduces our deficit spend to about $3 million for the year. Um, when we look at our revenue, uh, March revenue collection compared to prior year, and we look at our total revenue collected to the prior year, we are down. It looks significant. It's just a timing issue. Uh, at the end of the month, we had not received our tax payment for our what is our second collection, but the first half tax collection based on calendar year 23 and 24. We had not received it yet. I'm uh, happy to announce we did receive it, and it's trending to about where we expected it to be. So that will show up in the April uh, revenue scenario. Um, again, when you're off by $70,000 on $109 million, I don't think it's <laughs> worth getting into the details unless you really want me to. Um, but we're trending about where we thought we were up in a little, uh, some areas and down in some others, but overall we're trending about where we thought we would be. When we look at our expenses for the year, um, our month uh, March expenditures compared to the prior year, we're actually up a little bit, about $168,000. Again, that's not very significant. And we all know that we're down spending for the year because of the reduction of the transfer out uh, to fund the capital improvements and, and permanent improvements for the district. So overall, we're down about 1.6 million. Um, most of that comes up in um, salaries and purchase services, accounts for about half, a little bit less than half of that. And then all other expenses accounts for about a million. Um, again, we're through the end of March, so we have April, May, and June, so we're about three quarters of the way, we are three quarters of the way, not about three quarters of the way, through the fiscal year. Our spending for our buildings and most of our departments ends at the on Friday, um, so our, our budget's becoming pretty final at this point. Um, we're obviously planning for next year, preparing. Uh, budgets have been turned in. We're getting those into the system. Um, those will be used to evaluate the May update, which we'll have at the May board meeting. Happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Thank you. Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Heath, I ask for the uh, approval of items B through F in one motion, please. So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Jessling. Yes. Ms. Ayapolo. Yes. Ms. Morchaza. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Motions carry 5-0. 
At this time, we have um, some unfinished business to address. And the first is the review of library media materials discussion. So if I can go ahead and, and kick it off. I, coming out of the last meeting, uh, what I tried to do is capture everything that was set at the table um, and then take that back to what our procedures are and what our current policy says, what our administrative guidelines potentially could say. Um, and just to share with, uh, with the group, um, two different aspects of this. One is, is really getting into the selection of library and media center materials. Um, the, the guidelines um, that we will be, that we should be following, in, in my opinion, um, in the selection and ordering of library media center materials would be this. Um, our high school media specialist creates the collection of books for the elementary schools, the middle schools, and the high school to review based on grade slash age level. Step two, the individual building library assistants identify those books from the collection that they would like to order for their school library. Step three, each building principal reviews the book order list selected by their library assistant prior to sending the order back to the high school media specialist. Step four, the high school media specialist will be sharing each building's book order list with the district administrative team. And then step five, the district administrative team would review the book order list and make uh, a recommendation for the order to me as the superintendent. I would then have that final review of the book order list and then approve the purchase. This gives us a multi-step process with multiple eyes looking at each of these orders as we move forward with this process in the future. The second part was the uh, Library Media Center material checkout procedures. Um, what we did here again was try to uh, incorporate everything that uh, had been said previously um, trying to adapt um, what I had heard from Rose and Annie in a separate meeting, what I heard from um, Maggie in the, the meeting last month um, with kind of the stoplight piece to the puzzle, and then taking that and what our capabilities are within them. And, and then again, trying to close the gaps that we knew existed with what our current procedures were. So what we have come up with is, is something along these lines. Um, in the annual, one idea was to have three different levels. Really, I, I think it goes down to two because as was mentioned earlier, I believe in public participation, we've now made that decision to send those um, emails out um, to every family uh, when a student checks out a library media center material. Um, so what that comes down to, and, and again, select the material they would like to check out from the school library. They would take a student, and then the email is sent to the parent guardian indicating the title of the material that the student has selected. If the student has reserved access, the library assistant would complete the checkout process, place that material on a reserved shelf in the library. They would then be completing a library media center material approval slip. And then an email would also be sent to the parent indicating the title of the material that the student has selected. During that week, the parent or guardian would sign that library media center approval slip and in the subsequent week's library schedule, the student would return the previous week's library material media center approval slip. The student will select a new material along with all of their other classmates. The library assistant would complete that checkout process, pull the material from the previous week that's still on the reserved shelf and hand that material to the student that has already been approved by the parent or guardian. And then they would hand that material to the student and place the new material on the reserve shelf and then fill out the slip again. 
and then that process would repeat. So really the only week of the year that an elementary student would not be taking home a book would be that first week. After that, they would be receiving a reserved material off of that uh, shelf each time, unless of course there was um, a material that the parent or guardian did not want them to have. Um, then we would start that process over. Um, at the middle school, high school library uh, schedule, the student comes to the school library, uh, they can select a material, go to the library assistant, scan that material from the circulation system, brings up the student scan uh, or a student screen. Um, library assistant would be able to uh, determine what uh, level of access that student has and then follow a very similar format to what we have with the elementaries. The only issue, uh, difference there is it's not on a regular schedule, so just whenever that student would have that uh, approval slip signed, they could bring that back to the media center, um, turn in that slip, get the material off that reserve shelf, and then move on. And then the next time they would select something, the same process would, uh, would follow. So th those are the things that we've been able to determine that we can do within our uh, current systems. It kind of closes those gaps kind of incorporates a little bit of everything that was, was discussed. Um, so just wanted to make sure that everybody was uh, familiar with, with those procedures um, as we jump into the discussion. Does anyone wanna have any, I'll does just anyone say have any questions? Thank you for putting this together. Mm -hmm. I know it took a good bit of review and discussion with your team. Um, so I appreciate all of the attention to detail and, and making it uh, making it real for us. Thank you. I had um, Mr. Heath. I just had a quick question. The last month when we were talking about it, my concern was over the um, collaborative classrooms or silent reading time books that are just in the classroom for silent reading time, um, because a lot of the controversial issues that we experience with book challenges are also in kindergarten through fifth grade silent reading time books, and there's no notification for parents at all about those books. So you had mentioned you might be able to kind of fix that and get it included. I didn't hear it today. Is that something you're working on? Yeah, so that we would be able to follow a similar type of process here. We want to make sure that we're talking with especially our elementary classroom teachers to, to figure out how that process may work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation with the library assistants and our media specialist, obviously, to get a lot of this figured out with what's in the circulation system. Um, we, can, uh, we can start to take some of these ideas and present that from the classroom library um, uh, scenario as well then. Okay, so we're still kind of working on that, but that hasn't been thrown out, we can? Correct. Okay, thank you. Correct. Um, <clears throat> I like that, I think this is um, a good, good way to let parents feel comfortable in knowing what their kids are taking out. Um, the, my only issue would be if, if we do get a lot of parents choosing the um, reserved access, that could be a lot of red tape and it seems like a lot of work for a librarian. Um, one of the ideas I thought of, because we don't really have a lot of books that are majorly concerning, at least in the middle school and high school, um, so I was thinking of, um, you know, not flagging books, certain books, um, but marking them. Um, ideas were um, parent discussion required, PDR, um, and only if a, if a parent, if a student, parent um, opts to, um, that they want notification or approval, um, affirmative consent, then, and that book pops up with that marking on it, then we can go through that process because the majority of books, especially in elementary school, are going to be books on penguins and books on bunnies. And, you know, why, why go through all that? So, I mean, if uh, you, yours, that, that, that works. But, again, if we end up with a lot of parents choosing that second option. Um, and, you know, I was also thinking, you know, any parent is free to opt in immediately on day one. And then they're not, it doesn't matter what the book is marked. But, you know, a lot of these books, um, K through 5, would be more... Um, parental discussion required. So some of these books, maybe if it's a World War II book, maybe if it's a book um, about politics, maybe it's a, you know, a book that's about haunted, you know, some, some, one of our parents said that their 
they don't like scary books, things that kind of trigger them in that way. So we can just mark those, and that just means um, you know you're just it's just up for discussion, um, and that way if a, if a student with that marking. Um, with that affirmative consent label comes in to check something out and that book is marked, um, the, the, the librarian can say, hey, go pick out another one. Um, this one is, we're gonna, is on hold for you until we get that you know, confirmation. So similar to what you said, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it can reduce some of the red tape and work for our media specialists, but um, that, those are, that was my thought. Do you have that written down? Mm -hmm. <laughs> can okay. you send it to me? Yes, yes. I, I, got I will it. So you say don't need that to send it to me I, I do need. I do have some concerns about that because it's still creating a list of books, and I think the problem with that is that you just don't know what might be a was it a PDR PDR you said a PDR book you know because every kid has may have different issues you know it could be storms it could be war it could be people fishing, <laughs> you know, it, it just could be so many things that you're trying to think inside of that mind of what is a PDR book and what isn't, that we're going to exclude something that might be a PDR book, and then you have a parent that says, well, I thought I was getting notified if this book could cause concern. So if we keep the system more more simple with, with what I had originally proposed, and, and I'm fine with going to the, the yellow-red system or whatever, um, then it's, it's simply you're notified, you say yes if, mm -hmm. if you want notification, and then you can decide what may be a concern for, for any child. It, it's not that I think it's a bad idea. Yeah. It's just it's, it's too hard to decide where the line starts and ends. Yeah. Well, this would be have to be, we'd have to grandfather in most, this whole process, most of the, how we mark them, um, especially in the middle school and in the classrooms. But I think most of the major ones are, will be obvious to teachers. And then, I mean, um, you know, getting an email, I know for me, I have three kids in the, in the schools right now. And you, I just don't think it's realistic that parents are going to, you know, the, have the time to go through that and then to research each book, especially when a lot of the books are really going to, the majority of the books checked out to do this. And I think, you know, we still have it out. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think in terms of a library clerk who has, let's say, 450 books going out. She's got 20 minutes. And... I think a way of handling it, especially because I've been surprised at, you know, sometimes the scope or breadth of issues that somebody might have a concern about. Or again, like we had talked earlier in previous discussions, that your student might be have had an experience with fire. And for them, that's a particularly sensitive topic. You wouldn't mark every, you know what I mean? I just, I think because kids at the elementary level are probably taking one or two, generally speaking, you know, to, to each little media center has its own options. And we know at the middle school and high school, the numbers of books they're checking out is tiny. <laughs> So I don't think that it's necessary to take that responsibility. We're trying to honor all parents to have that final say-so and let them control it rather than us second-guessing anybody. That's where I worry. And the time involved and the administrative um, detail that will be involved could be difficult. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo those sentiments uh, of both Mrs. Cook and Mrs. Jessling. That I think this puts us right back where we were um, in terms of compiling lists and marking books. And I say, I know you said that you're not marking them, but you're flagging them. I mean, I kind of see it as the same thing. So again, I think this puts us back in the place of where we're regulating books when the initial idea um, was to really regulate the students and the access. 
Um, so I think that's the direction that's going to help us move forward, and that's the one I, I would support. Yeah, I, I didn't mean flag. I said not, not to flag it because it, marking it to me just felt oh, better okay. because what might be inappropriate or something I want to discuss with my kid um, on a topic might not be somebody else's, so I, it's, I didn't want to flag it. So I thought let's just yeah. mark it, you know, parental discussion need or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with parents being notified. I just, is it realistic that parents are going to, Want, you know, want to look at the, the emails or that, you know, a lot of my regular notifications go into junk. Um, I just, I'm just trying to look at, you know, the liability issue if we do have this and then a parent doesn't get access. Um, but, uh, you know, again, the important factor is that parents are being notified before something goes out. Um, I, again, I, I don't think we have a lot of books that require this marking, so I don't think it would be too tedious. And again, we could just do it. The, the media specialists can mark them as, as they come through. Um, I think, um, since I haven't said anything yet, I've just kind of been listening and I hear all the points. Um, and I'm happy that regardless, whatever comes out of this, we are going to add another layer um, for parental rights, which is important. To, to Rose's point, I don't think that we have a ton of, you know, a bunch of controversial books, and we do have a controversial issues policy that could help kind of align some of that if we were to look into that. I get what every, everybody's saying, and I don't, I don't really know exactly how that how yeah. it would work if we do have so many people. Is it really feasible? Mr. Pease, I'm assuming you kind of already looked into that. Like, if, if we have, what if we have 80% of the parents opt into the, you know, is it really, is it feasible to do that? Yeah, I do, what we're what we'll need to do is figure out after year one, you know, kind of what, where everybody is with those different levels okay. and figure out what the best approach is going to be. I, yeah. in, until we get to that point, we don't really know. And that's one of the reasons we made the decision just to email every family because mm -hmm. we had 2,500, 2,800 families that opted into the emails. Um, so we were able to make that adjustment fairly quickly. Um, with the, this type of situation because, uh, you know, the annual update's already being done right now and we're going to have to do a separate type of process here this first year through anyway. That'll give us a pretty good idea of how many um, are, are choosing which level of access and then what's going to be the, the most efficient way to, to do that in the future. Um, right now, um, there there's not an, an automated system to be able to allow us to just change the access um, in this in the circulation system it's going to be a lot of manual work for our library assistants as we go through that process but you know until we get this first year done we're not a hundred percent certain what direction we should probably go um, I I think whatever whatever the numbers are that's the notification that we put in uh, in the students screen yeah, you know, whichever one's less. Mm -hmm. So if, if they've got open access and you know, we only have you know, a, a, a thousand students that need open access, the, the, okay, let's put those thousand in and the other 6,000 can be left blank mm -hmm. because we know if it's not this, then it's mm -hmm. the other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the process right now that we're looking through. And that's the other reason it, you know, we, we tried to figure out what, what's the easiest way to do this. And we're, we're talking about another email, but again, you know, if we send another email, hey, you need to email us back with this approval, that, number one, it's more time for the, the library assistant to actually, you know, send that email and get that response. It, it's very simple to kind of go old school with this mm -hmm. where we have just a little slip. Here's the title of the book. <coughs> give it to the kid. Kid brings it back the, the next week, signed off by the parent. Um, so that's why we we kind of went old school with that uh, with that thinking right now. Just again to see how this process might uh, might work moving forward, and then uh, again, do we start looking at at different systems to try and automate this a little bit more? Yeah. But uh, we got to get some practice put in place and then see sure. how it works. Thank you. And the um, Rose had mentioned the sexual content policy. So my points on what you had mentioned earlier would just be the, I want to ensure that the classroom um, silent reading time books would be worked into this somehow. And then um, the sexual content policy, I would like to keep that policy so that things are still flagged as sexual content, because I think that has a different connotation, especially, I mean, the excerpts we heard tonight, I voted against, you know, retaining that book, and I think there was a lot of uproar in the community about 
those kind of uh, sexually explicit books. So I do think we should continue flagging those. You don't, you're not recommending that we stop that process of flagging along with. I don't really have a recommendation right now. I'll just wait for whatever you guys want me to do. I, okay. I've gone through a process already and there's only, there's I mean, there's not, there. there's not a lot that are flagged, so. And again, the other issue, and I know this has been mentioned several times now, when you look at the, those lists and, and you look at our weeding out guidelines, and a lot of these books are going to be weeded out fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that, that quote unquote list is going to be fairly small. Are you saying weeding out because of the five year? Okay, yeah. So that, those Because they be, haven't been checked out ever. <laughs> right. So those would just be my concerns, are those yeah. few points. Um, obviously, I just want to state for the record, I, I do not support sexually explicit books for minor students. But we've gone through this discussion several times. Um, so I think this would be the next best thing. Well, I'd, I'd like to talk a minute about the sexual content then, because if there's a book in, in your curriculum that contains sexual content. So I know we've mentioned To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, it has sexual content in it. There's a rape, it's discussed. So if, if you have a book that has sexual content in it that's in the curriculum and, and the students are expected to read the book and they're going to have discussion on it, then that, that book is, the parents are notified. In our current policy, that's, and that's what I would like to continue to see happen. So the parents are getting a letter that says, hey, our, your child is going to read this book. It does have sexual content in it. If you'd like an alternative book, please notify us, and, and I will do this. And, and that's, I see that happening right now with my own children's books. But the library books, if we have this already, I don't see the need to flag them. And there's a couple reasons. One, every parent gets notified what, what your child is reading. And if you are a person who has given the restricted ac access or the, the, the red light, then you are even giving permission, like, yes, they can read this book. I, I know the title. They can read the book, and you're signing it. I'm also concerned that our list isn't inclusive and and we've said that there are many books in the library that might have some mention of sex that a, and we only have books on the list that people already you know have already read and brought it forward in some way so it's so limited i don't feel that it's inclusive and i feel that it's a false sense of security if we say, oh, we are, we're flagging these books or we're whatever we want to call it, we're, we're notifying people that this list has sexual content, it makes it seem like it's all inclusive and it isn't. So I would be in support of taking out the portion for library access but keeping it for curriculum. So That's where I stand on that. I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, I don't. That's why originally with the sexually uh, the sexual content policy, I had mentioned sexually explicit because I do think mm -hmm. there's a, a vast difference between sexual content mentioning a rape. To Kill a Mockingbird doesn't stand in comparison to the bluest eye. You know, when you're graphically depicting molestation of a minor, that that's different. You know, so I think that I would be open to changing the policy to state sexually explicit. So that if it is sexually explicit, parents are at least notified of that because, gosh forbid, a parent, it doesn't, they do a search and, and look up, you know, I mean, what was the last one? Empire of Storms that we voted on, which Mr. Heath said was only one chap, small chapter out of the, I don't know, 800 page book that mentioned graphically, you know, sexual acts, um, depicting sexual acts in graphic detail. So that, you know, a parent's not going to be like, <laughs> Looking through to chapter 38, let me, let me go online and search that. So I think that it's just, like you said, an added layer, this whole process is, why not just keep that added layer instead of taking something away? We're trying to build on it. I have a question, so. though, I guess, in that scenario. Um, if we had this system implemented and you got an email or a request, um, whether it's a notification or, you know, depending on which 
group your child was in, you would have the ability to search it on, I know you often, I think somebody's referenced, is it good? Book, book looks. looks, book looks. So I mean, there are tools out there. You could Google it. You could certainly, you know, research the book uh, that you know your child's asking to to read, um, and and that way you could under you wouldn't have to go to you know chapter thirty page fifty second. You know, you would have the ability to kind of research it beforehand, right? Isn't that how this would wor work? Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but. That how it, that's what I envisioned. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. My, so my thing, the only way that would work, first of all, if you were to look up um, Empire of Storms, and I looked it up many times just to get a quick, oh, uh, you know, what is this book about, a quick blurb, it didn't have anything about what was in there. So you, you know, so maybe if, if I'd be okay with if you're going to, when we send out that notification for permission that we um, mention, make some recommendations, if you, like book, I mean, book looks so that people can act, parents can actually get right to the meat of it, you know, to see what it is because it also is a liability. Mm -hmm. You know, I think most parents that are going to just let's be honest, parents are busy. They have a lot of kids. They're working. They they have a lot going on. They may just be like, oh gosh, there's a lot of people are surprised that we had this book in the in our schools anyway. So if they just you know, are nonchalant about it, and oh yeah, they can have full access, and they find out that there's that kind of content. That's a, I feel like that we're liable for yeah. that. Wouldn't so the, the li I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm you were, Okay. So wouldn't the liability also be on the school then too? Because then parents would be relying on the, the librarian, the district, or whatever to provide recommendations, as you say. What if we're wrong? What if we're missing one? What if we're, as, as, as Mrs. Cook said, this list that we're making might not be inclusive. So then if they're relying on the district to provide said recommendation and find out, oops, we were wrong, or oops, we forgot, or we missed a page, whatever the case might be, there's liability there too. I think it's just an added, like we had mentioned, an added layer. I don't right. think that we're saying, yeah. we're just saying don't take anything away. If we're trying to build on this and build you know, trust in the community and parents, et cetera, why would we take another layer away? Especially if we do have, we know that there is a liability if a child has trauma and then reads a book like that and has been harmed from it, there could be potential liability with that. So just kind of an added layer to notify parents, hey, this one you know, has, is sexually explicit or has you know, graphic detail yeah. of, of sexual acts. There's also, um, in other states, there's a lot of states that have already switched over and they are now fining um, librarians, schools, boards, et cetera, for providing books that are uh, sexually explicit, not sexual content, sexually explicit, depicting you know, um, graphically in detail uh, sexual acts to minors. So <clears throat> I think it would be wise for us not to take it away and to just build on it and come together with the added um, layer that we had mentioned, that Mr. Heath had mentioned tonight. What do we do, though, if we are not comprehensive? What do you mean? So if there is some content that is not recognized in an item, it's not on a list. The other issue, too, and I was going to mention in terms of the elementary schools, the maturity level between a 5-year-old and an 11-year-old is significant. The difference between a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old is significant. So do you designate a book as being mature content, parental discussion needed, or whatever, based on what the youngest student who has access? So let's say a World War II book might be adequately written for the sensibilities of an 11-year-old, maybe my five-year-old, not so much. Can I clarify, are you talking about the, so you're not talking about the sexual content? You're not talking, talking about okay. sexual content, but <laughs> any kind of a, a marking where we assume the duty mm -hmm. of recognizing where anything belongs and anticipating how somebody might interpret the content of a book. I think what I like the most about this process is A, we recognize that we don't have a huge volume of books going home for any individual child. It's a couple higher, mm -hmm. higher grades, probably none. So I don't think it's unusually burdensome 
for a parent to look at one or two titles if they have concerns and whatever their concerns I recognize and, and respect. But I'm not going to try to second guess anticipating what, you know, there may be religious prohibitions, there may be political considerations, all of those kinds of things that we've seen in some of the book challenges that things that would seem innocuous to one person may be deeply concerning to somebody else. I, I don't think you can police all of it. And I'm not using that word in terms of, like, you know, ugly control, but just trying to to be a comprehensive, reliable buffer where somebody might have a concern. So if I get the notice that my son has checked out this book and this book, I can simply look into it or tell them, don't check out any more books. <laughs> at the, you know, whatever it might be. But if we assume that duty, I worry that it, it's a false sense of security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that your point, I think, is excellent. The vast majority of things in our libraries are completely innocuous. You know, it's bees, <laughs> it's, you know, Australia, whatever it might be. And that, um, you know, parents don't need to have an undue concern. But we're saying that we're not trying to prejudge what is right for your child, your family, because you know best for your child. So I love the idea of ultimately respecting parental rights and control, and they get the say-so, and I like the way it's arranged, too, so that there is empathy for a student just that first mm -hmm. time you don't get your book until you know a parent has a chance to, to check it. So I think it's worth putting it in the water and see if it floats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm fine with let's do a trial run and see how many yeah. parents come back and want that and see if it's feasible. Um, but to Annie's point with the sexually explicit, you know, obviously we can't, we have to have some kind of disclaimer on our notifications. Like we cannot guarantee that every book has been marked, but for the majority of the, like, the books that are sexually explicit, when they come in front of us, um, and we can do searches to find those. I think that that's at least showing that we're making an effort. Um, but yeah, I'm fine with, let's see how many parents want that um, approval and I guess, you know, go from there. I think too, um, just to clarify a point about the policy, the sexual content policy, right now it is only, Mr. Heath went above and beyond and by flagging the additional books that were brought up by a, a community member um, so that you know, it'd be flagged and not all of them necessarily would be challenged. But the policy actually states that it is only for anything coming in that's new mm -hmm. and anything that's been challenged. Mm -hmm. So that takes away, you know, our policy, we'd fall back on our policy that states anything new or, or challenged. So it's just an extra layer. I don't think we should take it away. I, think I, I know, I that. just, I think that that's why it's such poor policy. Right. Because it, it doesn't work well because it's so limited. Mm -hmm. It, and it's one thing when you have it in the curriculum, the teacher that's about to teach it, they know that book inside and out. They can tell you it has sexual content and we're you know, sending home a notification and you can pick an alternate material. But because right now we're like, well, if this is brought up, it's on the list, but if it hasn't been, it, it's, it's weak. And we're, we're putting ourselves at risk, we're putting our students um, when parents feel they don't want the kids to see this material, it, it's not protecting them at all. It is in no way protecting them. So a parent that goes so far as to say, I don't want my child to come home without a book, without permission, will take the time in a week to get an email and research the book. And there are many different sources out there that they can do to research the book. I mean, it's a quick... Google, is there sexual content in this? Is there, you know, controversial topics in this? Is this book dangerous? I mean, everyone knows how to Google search. They can make a phone call if, if they felt they needed more guidance to any of the school. I, I just don't understand why it's not enough for a parent that says, I want to know, I want to give permission, if they 
have the opportunity to get permission, why we would say that that's not enough. I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't see, and, and from my perspective, I don't know why we would fight so hard to remove the flagging system to notify parents that there's sexually explicit material in a book, especially a book like The Bluest Eye, which is extremely graphic and you know, emphasizes pedophilia and molestation of a minor. And I think people expect us to have standards. So if we're going to include books like that, I do think we should continue flagging them. But it's not consistent, though, because if we're only chal or if we're only considering flagging the books that are new or challenged, then there might be other books in our stacks that could have that sure. content. So it's, I guess, to your point, Mrs. Cook, that's what makes it weak policy. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. furthermore, um, part of the impetus behind a new policy framework like this is to help us move beyond book challenges um, because they have taken, and we talked about this last month, they have taken up so much time, they have taken up so many resources, um, so much of the board's time, Mr. Heath's time, so it sort of negates the whole point of the, the idea, and that's, I think, maybe what you were trying to say. I, I want parents to feel confident that they have control over what their child reads, and I don't know how better it is to say, can your child read this? And they say yes, and they sign it. I don't know how we can get any more strict than that. So, I think the the the, the real the reality is you're you're a teacher. Hmm? You're not every you say it's as simple to Google. It's not as simple, and a lot of parents aren't going to even look because their assumption is that this stuff isn't going to be in school. So why don't to do that then? Why don't we make sure that when we send that notification home? We put somewhere on there that, you know, some kind of disclaimer. Please, we, we know it is our. We, this, we haven't been able to vet every single one. We can't guarantee. It's a. This is a process. We're, we're marking as, as needed. Or whatever we re give recommendations. You know, we recommend that you look to make sure beyond a couple lines. Do your research just to protect the district. So, so just a statement that's on the permission slip right. that just says, right. you know, we please research the book that your child is. I think a lot of parents were gonna, are I'm going to ignore the keep, email. But you're saying the sexual content policy. Right. Oh, yes, yes. But I'm just saying in general, keep, right. keep, you know, don't assume that because parents, we know, look how hard it is to get the um, annual update. <laughs> it's hard mm -hmm. for parents to put that time in, and we want to, we don't want anyone to be surprised. And I think they they assume that we it's everything that comes from the school has to legally be fine and it can't you know and as we saw by what was read it's not always that the case so um, I know what you're saying it seems how, what more could you do but we want to we want we don't want to just throw out a, a, um, a policy or a, a method that's going to help us check the box we want to make it eat really what's in the best interest of the kids and, and help parents get there too so and I think um, you know we had I heard it's weak policy well I didn't recommend doing it from only new material and challenge material the original policy proposal was to include everything and vet everything mm -hmm. so that was changed because there was discussion about oh, yeah, um, is it feasible is it not, not feasible, feasible. <laughs> so um, I, I don't believe we should ever I mean the bluest eye, it was brought up for, for a vote. We heard the excerpts tonight. There are going to be parents who are not OK with that and who don't know that title who deserve to have just a little flag there. Hey, you know, it's just an added but, precaution. Why would we take away an added precaution? It just doesn't because make sense. Because again, we're, we're letting parents know what the child is asking to take out. So I, again, it puts it back on the district. And we're trying to alleviate the burden of that work uh, from our very overworked and overwhelmed staff. Um, and it's a shared responsibility, truly, between the parents, uh, guardians, and the school. So we have to work together and ultimately respect the rights of the parents and caregivers. Um, and I think that this policy does that. I think a shared responsibility is what I'm also getting at. It's you're putting it on the parents, but then also we're doing our part when it comes to sexually explicit materials and, and just you know, working with them and collaborating with them. So, okay. Did you get all that, Mr. Heath? No, just kidding. <laughs> I've been trying to take notes. Um. Do, you, 
do you have enough information to draft policy? We can make an, uh, another attempt at it. Um, mm -hmm. So, so really, taking what we've done or what I presented here earlier, making sure that we have the classroom library component added into this at some level, and and again, I've been kind of jotting some some questions in my own mind about that that process as well. Um, and, and then was there something about adding something to the approval slip? Like a Language. disclaimer. But so I guess here's, I just want to clarify what we're doing next, um, just so I can see Mr. Heath is, is maybe looking for direction. And so I, I guess if we can compartmentalize some of this, because we, we kind of talked about a few different areas of policy here. If we could just start with drafting this one here with the classroom library uh, component incorporated, could we just say like that, that can start moving forward? Is that what we're agreeing to So right it would now? be a policy that would create two levels of access for library materials, mm -hmm. and it sounds like classroom, classroom. library materials, mm -hmm. where you would have notified access and then the access with permission. And I think it would be important to, in taking all this into account, that Mr. Heath will confer with IT, the people who have to administer it. I worry more about classroom libraries than anything sure. else, since they're not yeah. in digital records. Mm -hmm. And even, even mm -hmm. like older kids can jot down the name of the mm -hmm. book that they're taking or putting on reserve or whatever with you know, like 11 five-year-olds. <laughs> but I think taking what he's mapped out seems very reasonable. Let's see how that works mm -hmm. for this coming fall. And regroup if, if it doesn't seem workable or, you know, whatever the uh, implementation is going to be. Maybe not add anything else to yeah, see how that just goes. start start here, but I, it does sound like we're going to need to address other areas of twenty five twenty that series of policy when it comes to lists of books or flagging, marking, whatever we're going to call it. Um, so that would need to be dealt with separately. It sounds like, right? Yeah, I don't see it as part of this policy. Right. I'd say we should look separately at making sure that our language is is clear. Okay. We had a few different discussions about the sexual content, you know, what it really does. Mm -hmm. Does that does that sound better, Mr. Heath? I just, your brow was so furrowed over there. I was trying to come to your rescue. <laughs> I'm just done so, with this whole conversation. I hear you. Um, <laughs> um, so are we looking at this from the administrative guideline standpoint, or do you want this part of policy? Mm. I thought I it was like policy. policy, yeah. So we will do the first part under the policy that would be part of the selection of library media center materials so that it's explicit in there. Mm -hmm. And then the second part would be in, I'd have to look at the specific series again to figure out which one it is, but uh, incorporating a library media center material checkout procedure um, in the policy for just the library media center pieces right there. And then figuring out, because um, I, I know part of the, the classroom library component, um, when those came out, and, and then I've got to go back to what, our, uh, what we did at the beginning of the year, I think the, those lists were made available um, during uh, the opening parent meeting night, um, where they were able to review those mm -hmm. things there. You know, in, in trying to figure out how we operationalize this with our classroom teachers. And that, the, the, again, those are some of the questions that I'm writing myself here as we're having this conversation as well. Um, trying to incorporate that into this particular part of the policy too. So you're, you're saying incorporate the silent reading time books, not just, because I know it previously 
it was. You can come in, you can look over the list. But the, right. as we know, there was a book, George, in there that most parents wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't would have glossed right over it. And as a board, not the new new board members, but we had decided not to include that in the collection um, mm -hmm. because it was not appropriate, you know, for fifth grade. Students. Yeah, because so, those are broken down by specific grade level too with I those classroom medium. libraries yeah. so that they were very specific to the grade level. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that may be part of the language that I'll pull into this as well and, and I'll try and get that sent out um, in our board update this week so that we can see how all of that might Kind of intertwined. I'd, I'd almost like to suggest something a little different with the classroom library, and and I don't know if that's, you know, something we might want to think about and and see um, getting input from the teachers, but a lot of times those books are like silent reading, free read types of things. They're not checked out. Right. So that's if there was an opportunity during um, open house mm -hmm. or you know visit days where the books are out and the parents can just come in and maybe they it's more of a I don't want my child reading these books and it's kind of a list yeah. if they want if if a parent so chose to do look through the library and just decide I, I don't want my kids reading these then maybe that's more of a the restricted access in that way versus mm -hmm. they get a note back and forth every day because that would that could become very cumbersome I think, though, that we've had a lot of issues with the collaborative classroom book list, like the material that is in that, and it's for silent reading time. So if we're talking about parental rights, parents deserve to know what their kids are reading during silent reading time, especially when they're not able to bring them, at least with library books. If anything, I think it should be applied more to the classroom library than anything else because the kid doesn't bring it home. So the so, parents don't so know. So they would know, though, because... How would they know? Because if, if your child was in our district, they would go, you would look in your classroom, and you would say, I don't like this book, this book, this book. So they would have a list of, you know, Mrs. Payne's child wouldn't read these books. You know, but you don't know. The, yeah, yeah, and there's, and there's books like And Tango Makes Three, which is a huge controversial book that's in our second grade classrooms. Most parents wouldn't look at that. It's two penguins and a, mm -hmm. a little baby penguin on the cover, most parents would just gloss right over that. They're not, you know, if you tell them, hey, it's actually, you know, a book about two male penguins that, you know, kind of adopt this other penguin and they fall in love and whatever. So that, that to me is not giving parents the right to know what's in their kids' classroom during silent reading time. You're putting all of the ownership on the parents and we don't have that shared collaborative process then. So, you would say like they would just do the same thing. They would bring a slip home like tomorrow I'm going to read the penguin book. And it would, I don't know, the name was what? Tango makes? And Tango makes three. And Tango makes three. So tomorrow my child's going to read and Tango makes three. And then it comes back and, and you would say, I don't want my child to read that book. So then, you, then the child goes, well... I can't read that book. So is there another book? Yeah. So that's that's how you're envisioning it. Or some kind of, yeah. I mean, I think parents okay. deserve to know what their kid's reading. And I think a lot of times, too, they read the same, from talk, at least from me talking with some elementary school teachers, they might read the same book for, you know, several days. So, yeah. But I, I'm not opposed to that either. I just was trying to think about how, we could make it easier in the classroom. Yeah, I see what you're saying. But, I just think what we're doing right now is not working by putting it out on the, on the Meet the Teacher night. Nobody wants to sit there and, and then we're not books. allowing them to take a picture of the books so they can't go home and Google search them. If we were mm -hmm. like, hey, these are the books that are in the classroom, take them home, look over them. Some may, they may have controversial themes in some of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, one book even, it was like for fourth grade or something. No, maybe third grade. <clears throat> and it was talking about how many child marriages there are in the United States. And that, for some people, might be like, I don't want my kid reading about that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think we should give the silent reading time books just as much, you know, parental yeah, rights I, for that. Yeah, I can get behind that. I, I have no problem with letting parents know and letting them decide what their, their child can and cannot read. I mean, that's why I proposed this, so. 
Okay, yeah, that, <laughs> let me, that may take a little bit longer than Friday to get that uh, figured out, but, um, but I think I've got the direction, so I will, um, um, at the very least, I'll make sure we've got the, the Library Media Center material <clears throat> pieces to you guys um, and where that might fit in policy um, by Friday. The classroom library component then, um, that may be a couple more weeks um, to do some digging and, and have conversations with uh, not just our administrators, this is gonna get into the classroom teacher aspect as well. We can kind of start that process a little bit tomorrow um, we actually have a meeting uh, with our uh, our union representation that we can kind of toss this out there as, hey, we need to gather some information about how this might work um, and, and start to figure out how those procedures might look in each individual classroom that we have across the, the district here. Um, okay, I, I think I've got the direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, another matter of unfinished business that it isn't on the agenda, but it we do need to mention it is our scholarship committee. We have two members of the scholarship committee, Ms. Marchaza and uh, Mrs. Payne, and they now have all of the applications. Um, and the only reason that we're mentioning this is because you, you, it, it is a board committee. And as a board committee, we need to sunshine notice when you are getting together to um, discuss your candidates for to recommend for the scholarship. Um, we do need to have that done before the senior night. And um, I, I trust that you can look through those applications and then talk with Mr. Heath about a time that you can both get together to have that done in time. Okay. So. Okay. I have to, yeah, He's got to do the sunshine, I do the sunshine notice. notice. And okay, then we'll, we'll put it for executive session. I think we should be talking about student, student. information. So. Yes, thank you. And then one of you will have to be your secretary. Okay, okay. thank and you. And provide me with the minutes so that we can get them approved at a later date. And because okay. it's executive session, it wouldn't necessarily have minutes, right? Oh, that's a good point, yeah. Uh, any I mean, just in just and out. That, yeah, your time you started, who was present. Um, mm -hmm. What time, and then when you motion to end the meeting. Gotcha. Okay. And then any discussions that you would have that wouldn't be relevant to executive session that need to be documented. Just <laughs> any discussions that would you say? Outside of executive session that you had that might be relevant. Okay. Um, we will now address new business. And our first item is um, Board Policy 0169.1, Public Participation at Board Meetings Discussion. And Ms. Marchaza asked that this was on, so Thank I'm going to open it. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so yes, I, am, I would like to uh, discuss this as a group today. Um, I have some ideas. Um, this is a topic that is really important to me, uh, notably the um, engagement with the public. Um, in fact, only almost exactly one year ago, um, it was April 11th, 2023, I was sitting out there in the audience in this very room. I made my way up to the podium to talk about school safety that day, actually, um, but also to talk about public participation and engagement. And what I said was, I had my <laughs> notes that I pulled out from that day. Um, I got up there and I said, you know, the hearing of the public is really important. Um, it all gives us the chance to stand up, to speak out, and put in our two cents as parents and taxpayers. Um, it, but, but honestly, it's, it was the same thing every month, and it, uh, I don't think it's changed too terribly much um, since I have come to sit on this, um, on this board. So uh, the hearing of the public, I, th I think the real challenge with it is that it's very one way. And that is what I said that night as well. It doesn't provide the opportunity for actual dialogue and collaboration, which is the only real path to resolution on the constant stream of issues that we face. And I continued saying, that's why I'm asking the board and administration tonight to create a space and opportunity for dialogue that enables us to come together to create solutions. I suggested an advisory committee, a group of parents or community members overseen by a mediator, 
Um, and basically I said, however it's done, it's gotta be done soon. Please, I asked the board to invest in this type of effort so that we can work through the division, through our differences, and create solutions that will make Mentor Schools the best it can possibly be. I hope this sounds familiar to you all. Um, and quite a few people I was surprised to hear um, clapped that night. Um, some of them are in this very room tonight. So today, here we are, one year later, I'm sitting up here as an elected member of the governing board, and it is a privilege. And I have the opportunity now to do something about this. It's an issue that I campaigned on. I promised that I would address it, and so I'm doing that today. Our policy states that the board should, quote, conduct its meetings in a productive and efficient manner that assures the agenda of the board is completed in, as, in a reasonable period of time, end quote. And I hope we can all agree <laughs> that last month's five-hour meeting, a record, um, was not a reasonable period of time for anyone. Uh, not the public, not the board, or the staff. I would have to wake up very early in the morning to run our schools. And indeed, we didn't even finish the business of the day. We had to schedule an additional meeting just so that we could conduct our executive session. That means that we all had to get together again. We had to sunshine a meeting. We had to all be paid. And basically, the taxpayers' cost doubled that night. So there are a lot of costs. There are opportunity costs. There is actual monetary costs. And of course, there's the cost of us not being able to address the true business. And finally, the cost of the loss of public trust. And of course, we're already struggling with that as it is. So I still believe we're not making enough progress in this area, which is why today I'm proposing that we revisit our overall approach to public engagement. Our current approach, as I said earlier, was very one way. With speakers coming up to the podium, they share their thoughts, and that's important. We should maintain that. However, we must have dialogue. We also need to ensure that we as a board are making the best use of our time, the best use of our leadership here in this district's time, and the public's time, of course. And we want to ensure that we can solve problems that will improve student achievement in our district. So what I'd like to see us do is maintain a reasonable space for public comment in our regular board meetings, these meetings that we're at tonight. But I would like to limit them, as many other districts do. In fact, we're kind of an outlier. I did a bunch of research before tonight um, and found many districts have time limits of various lengths, it really it does vary, and I'll provide some examples here coming up. But if we do this, we have to create another space for dialogue that will allow us to be more productive, more constructive going forward. So I did look around in other districts, and here's what I found. One idea is to have a single session for public comment, as most of you who have been coming to these meetings for a long time, some of you just started coming. So you all know now that we have two sections for public comment. So some districts choose to consolidate those into a single session. Some keep the two sessions, but they make them shorter. Um, they have time limits for public comment ranging from 20 minutes to 60 minutes. And in each case, of course, these could be extended by a majority of the, so like for, for example, if we see that there are gonna be a lot of speakers who do wanna speak, the board could actually vote to extend the time limit. So there's still flexibility there and I'm open to all of these ideas. These are just some. Um, Willoughby Eastlake has a 20 minute limit for public comment and they cap it at seven speakers, which is interesting. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, Brecksville, Broadview Heights, Mayfield City Schools, Hamilton and Marysville, and Forest Hills all have a 30 minute uh, limit. Um, Forest Hills kind of does it a little differently where they have one 30 minute session, no cap on speakers, but they'll adjust the time per speaker if they um, have more additional, you know, speak more than expected. So for example, if they've got 10 speakers, in 30 minutes, everyone gets three minutes, but if they have additional speakers, everyone gets less time. So they kind of make those adjustments as needed. Um, Chardon and Kenston, they have 60 minute limits. Um, Beachwood, Westlake, they have two sessions of 15 minutes each. 
Um, Riverside doesn't have a specified time limit, but it, they, in their policy, they note that the presiding officer can choose to impose a limit um, if they choose. Um, so those are just some different ideas of what, in fact, I kind of found that we were an anomaly in a way with no time limit whatsoever. So that's something to think about. Think about. And I'm not suggesting, I, I want to make it clear, I don't want to do away with public participation. That was never my intention. I apologize for any rumor going around that I would want to do such a thing. Anyone who knows, um, knows me from these meetings knows that I've supported it and participated it in a long time. But um, what I want to suggest is, is that we allow this space for that one-way Converse, not conversation, that one way, a monologue, honestly, is what it is, but that we open up another space for dialogue. Um, so that could look like a few things. There's um, coffee and conversation with school leadership. This is something Dr. Ward does in Willoughby Eastlake, and so far it's been going really, really well. Um, it can include the superintendent, the <laughs> Mr. CFO, uh, and possibly board members if they choose to attend. Um, we could do, and, and this is something that we, I think Mr. Heath has already embarked on with our strategic plan, is um, community presentations with Q, uh, you know, sessions for Q&A. Um, town hall meetings, possibly, and that's another idea that I heard about. Uh, a district in Ohio is doing town hall meetings for 30 minutes before their regular public meetings to give space for dialogue. It could be about a certain topic every time. Anyway, so um, these are some ideas. I want to open it up to the board. I know that five hours is a record. That's not typical, but um, it's, it is typical for us to have three hour, four hour meetings. We all know that. We've been doing these a long time. So I, I really, my goal is to help us streamline our meetings. We actually, we just got an email this morning about that from a community member saying five hours is beyond the pale. Um, let's, let's fix this. So this is, again, something that's important to me, something that I think will help us improve our meetings and also um, improve things for all of you folks who so diligently attend every month. So. I'll stop there and open to some thoughts. So just to clarify, you 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 said you didn't want to limit, but th that you wanted to add on, but then you said we would possibly get rid of and only have one section. Would you be open to keeping it how it is, but also adding on and just doing those forms? Because I think that's a great idea. I'm sorry, wh what's your question? Can you just repeat it? Yeah. So are you looking to get rid of one of the sections of public commentary in order to add the forums? I'm looking to, well, I'm honestly open to ideas. Okay. What I suggested was to consolidate them. That means having public comment on agenda items and not agenda items put together. That's literally what that means. Right, so, so you would have, like Willoughby is like, I'm aware of what they do um, over there. But why would we not continue and then also add on to with those town hall meetings and see if the public commentary then automatically goes yeah. Um, because the idea is to streamline the meeting, right? And so if we're going to, if we can limit the space here but add over here, I'm looking for balance. And I'm looking for more productive and effective meetings. And I think that that's, that's you know, limiting here but opening up space here would allow us to do that. That's what I'm suggesting. Um, okay, I like the idea of having, you know, a, a, two-way communication. Um, I am in no way in favor of limiting in any way. So when controversial issues come up, and we, that's when we have a lot of people coming to speak, and we saw last, last month, um, already we had a decrease in people speaking because they see that we're, we came up with a solution and we're listening to what they're saying. So um, if we just do more of that, if we just start listening to what our voters are saying and asking, mm -hmm. we won't have this. Yeah. I would, I would echo that. I would agree with that. I think we've had this conversation. We had it probably about a, I don't know, a year ago um, with Tom and Mary on the board. And we, when we came up with some of these changes to the policy, because we already did restrict it before, it was no time limit. You know, we would just completely go for, go forever. And we did have meetings like we had last month mm -hmm. several times, and that, that's why we changed up the yep, I remember. Um, the registration process and all of that. So I do think that we. And we were, we were given some of the details of the other neighboring districts as well. Um, I would be very hesitant. I would not support limiting public commentary any further, even though 
been here for two and a half years and I've had my fair share, I think all of us have, of um, you know, not so nice comments, but that's that's their right, right? You know, that's what they they, they get to do that for three minutes and No, I, I absolutely. Wouldn't... People should get their three minutes. Mm -hmm. Um what I'm suggesting is allowing space for a better opportunity for discussion, for a higher quality conversation. Those people would still have their three minutes, or however many minutes, they would still have the ability to participate in public discussion, but it would be higher quality. It would get us somewhere. It wouldn't just have us sitting here listening. We, as, as practice dictates, can't respond to questions when, when Ms. Braley, I believe it was, got up and, you know, she didn't get an answer to her question because that's not our protocol. And so what I'm looking for, what I'm after, is a higher quality conversation. I think that the only issue with that, too, because we had had this discussion um, previously, was that if we only limit it to the beginning, then we vote on something and people feel like they don't get to, you know, get up to the podium whether we like it or not. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm open and, to where it happened, honestly. Like, but that, that's the problem then, though, because that you can't you can't have it just at the end because then people deserve to speak on agenda items prior to our vote, mm -hmm. but they also deserve to speak at the end Again, yeah. based on our vote. And we could, I suggested multiple formats, so it's, I'm not married to any single one of these. The way we do it, I just think I want to see better interaction with the community, and I, I don't think that this format allows it. We ran into also an issue of legality with deciding who then gets to speak. That gets us into muddy waters. And so, because if we have only 30 minutes of public speaking in the beginning, who, and we have, you know, Yeah, so the way the other people. districts have done this is to, um, this might fall to Mr. Wade, it might fall, I don't know who exactly, but, um, the person, whoever is, um, it can't obviously be any of us, uh, has to ensure a diversity of opinion. So, for example, um, I know Willoughby Eastlake and other districts, um, I can't remember exactly which one here that I have written, it could have been Beechwood, but they, they ensure um, uh, you know, a diversity of, of opinion. So basically, if somebody gets up and says, I don't want funding for that baseball field, or what have you. And then the next person says, I don't want funding for that baseball field either. Um, basically, you want to have one um, person get up and represent that point of view, and then the rest is sort of redundant, right? So that's kind of what I'm looking at, is, is a, a la allowing someone to cultivate um, uh, that public comment opportunity with diversity of opinion, uh, without redundancy to help us really streamline our meetings a bit. Would some, I mean, Mr. Wade, would you feel comfortable ensuring diversity of opinion and having that all on you? Uh, first, I can speak for myself. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could. I mean, I don't know if I can do that. To be quite frank, um, I, I do understand the redundancy point. Um, we do randomize the people who sign up, so I use Google. It does it for me. I don't do it. I just put the names in based on how they come in. Right before the meeting, I, I highlight them, click randomize the data set, mm. it shuffles them through, and that's how we get, just mm -hmm. in case you wondered, that's how I know who's going to speak <laughs> when. I don't put them in my order that I want to do that, because I don't really care to do that. I mean, that's just, it's just easier to use technology to make it random. Mm -hmm. um, for that being said, if you chose to do that and you said that we're going to limit it to six speakers each session, mm -hmm. I can't guarantee with that method that we're going to get diversified opinion because it could be five people who all believe one way and it could be the mm -hmm. one person who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that's, that's the piece. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, I think we attend, several of us, to, not this past November, the November before, attended that OSBA Capital Conference. Um, and we had kind of asked, posed this question to the uh, presenter. And he recommended that you don't limit the, like, pick and choose who gets to speak because it does get you, you could get you into, um, you know, legal issues. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you, I think, I swear you were, you guys were in it too. I, I believe so. The, a couple of thoughts. I, I love having the other dialogue piece. You know, ways that we can 
engage with a community, that we can pick topics that are important to the community and, and have forums on them where you know, we can have discussion or inform, answer any questions, any myths out there. So I, I, I love that part, and, and I hope that we do that at a bare minimum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing that I see, and maybe it's, it's just the role as the president is one thing that we have an issue with right now with the two formats for public participation, the agenda, non-agenda mm -hmm. items, is the agenda, sometimes we have people that speak on non-agenda items. It's true. And mm -hmm. sometimes we have people that really stretch what that agenda item <laughs> is. So you're kind of like, because we're talking about money, <laughs> Is that an agenda item? Because money's on our agenda, right? How we, you know, so it, it has become difficult to police that. Mm -hmm. um, not that that's the only reason, but to, to have it restrictive with agenda, non-agenda items, I'm not sure that that's super effective because I don't know that we really follow it. If we did one point of public participation, I hear what Mrs. Payne is saying, do you do it? I, I would definitely want to hear what their input before I take mm -hmm. a vote. Mm -hmm. Because that is the purpose, right. is to inform us, and, and we're listening to, to their vote. To your point about not being able to engage with us after the vote, they would be engaging with us in a different way. They could still email us, they could still talk to us afterwards, and they could also talk at the next meeting. So if we only had one public participation, I would say that it wouldn't have limits. So it wouldn't be just agenda items. It would be agenda and non-agenda items. Mm -hmm. And then people wouldn't have to wait right. for hours <laughs> to talk because maybe someone just had a point where, I, hey, I just wanted to talk about the cafeteria, <laughs> but you started at 7 and now it's 10 and, and I'm still sitting here listening to you. So it, it's, a, it's a point that if we had one public participation at the beginning and it wasn't limited to anything then that would that might be nicer for people. Yeah, I think even that would just be an improvement alone. So these are just ideas. Talk to other districts, talk, you know, looked at mm -hmm. other policies. Um, I think any, any movement would be a positive one. I stand pretty firm on having both opportunities on agenda items. I think, to your point, Mrs. Cook, they, we could put, I mean, they already have to fill out a form, so why don't we make it a re requirement where they have to list on the form what agenda item specifically they're, you know, going to speak about. So I think that could clear up some of it. I don't think it's something that happens all the time, but to, for your, to your point, I can understand what you're saying, and I, I think we could fix it with something, you know, like that. But to take away public commentary from one section, I, I just... Well, I wouldn't say We're take it away. They it. just are right. allowed combining. to speak at any time. Yes. yes. They can speak at the beginning about anything they wish. Right. They, so it it wouldn't be away. that they could only speak on agenda items. They could just, mm -hmm. they can just speak yeah. whenever. I, I just feel like that's, I think people deserve the right after we vote to get up and say, oh, you guys didn't bring up this point, or you voted and you forgot this part of it, you know, and they could have a valid point. I just think it's their right. They should be able to do it. I actually defended <laughs> Ms. Marchaza here in uh, September of 2022, I think it was. Um, and actually, Fox News had reported on it and said, one woman attacked Payne. I don't believe that you attacked me. So just to clarify that. But uh, you know, there was definitely a review and critique of me. And it says the Republican board member um, attacked Payne, the Republican board member, for being so vocal about the issue without having of her, any of her own children in the school district. She was interrupted multiple times by community members. You were interrupted. But Payne defended her right to speak. And I said, I'm for <laughs> First Amendment rights, so I'd be glad for you to finish your review of me. Um, and then I said, I'd like to use mine as well, so you go ahead. And then you had said, 
you get to sit there and I don't, the mm -hmm. woman shot back. That's the difference. So now you're sitting here, and I think we should give people the same right that you have to speak on the beginning and at the end. And I'm, I'm firm on that. I get that. We are so still that. allowing. Thank you. Okay, to clarify again, we are still allowing folks to participate in public comment. We're talking about consolidating, and nothing is stopping them from doing so the following meeting or contacting us independently to share their thoughts post vote. The opportunity is still there. Well, you're cutting it in half, though. But no, because we're not talking about time limits. We're consolidating it into a single section so these good folks out here don't have to wait till midnight to say their piece. I think a solution to that aspect of the agenda is make the first one, make both of them on anything. And that way, folks that want to get something out can say it at the beginning and leave. And then folks that want to rebut at the end have that opportunity as well. But I think each voter should have the opportunity to get their six minutes, regardless of how we where we put that. And again, I we're already seeing a big de decrease. I don't know what the second pu public you know today is going to be as if it's long, but it's, yeah, it's longer than the first. You know, I I think we've had a lot of turmoil in the last couple of years, and that's why these meetings are like this. They shouldn't be like this all the time. Jenny, have you had the, in your in your no. Tenure, no. this is unprecedented. So let's yeah. just listen to everybody, work together as a board, and then we we will be out of here sooner, I hope. That's just my answer. So it's the time. If it was six minutes at the beginning, it wouldn't uh, Well, I agree with it. Mrs. Payne. I think sometimes, you know, we need to be held accountable for a vote, and, and that gives, you know, they have the right to stand up there and call. You know, take sure. A I, I'm time. not disagreeing. I yeah. just want to clarify. Yeah. No, I, I like how it is. I think the changes that were made and signing up and making sure that you live here, um, that you're not coming in from out out of the district and speaking. You know, yeah. I think those changes were good, and I I, I don't think it's going to needs to be a problem month after month, and that should be our goal. You know, so I Could, wouldn't change it at all. Except any other agenda, discussion? Except the agenda that part at the beginning, if you know, to say it, they don't. It doesn't have to be an agenda item. That I would be okay with. Okay. Any other discussion on, on that's, this? That's an policy? interesting point, actually, because maybe if we did do that, but we still had in the policy that you can't speak on the same topic twice. That's what our policy says yeah. now. Like you can't speak on an agenda item and then at the end speak on that same agenda item. Mm -hmm. No, um, you can. No, you can. It's, you yeah. can? Yeah. No. I thought it said you can't. Yeah. You can only speak on this one topic once. One time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you could speak at two different. The, Correct, but you but can't talk about the same topic. Yeah. topic. Right. Oh, okay. You couldn't so, talk about books twice. Oh. You have to talk about books and finance. Right. <laughs> so you're recommending everybody to be on the finance. Finance. So, yeah. Got it. Um, but yeah, to, to to your point, I do think that maybe maybe if we change the beginning to both, that would help the point that Ms. Martraza had yeah. about people, you know, having to wait until the end. But also, I know that we've had discussions before about how beneficial it is. We don't want people just come in speak and then leave and not see the outcome of what they're speaking on or right. see the discussion because that leaves questions so i just feel that that makes it hard for some folks to participate especially if they have child care you know and you know they maybe can't stay until midnight or whatever time it is right now um that you know we don't those folks unfortunately have to opt out of speaking in the second half of the meeting so that's another consideration to think about I have concerns about the time for our CEO and our CFO. Yeah. I, if it was just us, mm -hmm. you know, right. I, that's what I signed up for. Right. But I don't know that it's a good use of their time. Yeah. Five hours of their time. Mm -hmm. Imagine if the, it was a 90 minute meeting and the other three and a half hours could have been devoted to something else. Right. I would argue that so that something else would have been a, a productive and positive. So I don't know if we had a town hall interactive format mm -hmm. that it would resolve anything. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we don't have an interactive format is that there is not necessarily an opportunity to gather thoughtful factual 
data-driven mm -hmm. information to respond in a coherent, meaningful way. Yeah. So having a group or an individual express their opinion and demand answers, if I don't have answers at my fingertips, I need time to yeah. compile answers, I don't know that that's going to be good. I think that we would have to put in some structure around that and um, allow our leaders to curate um, the content, right? So this month's town hall will be about topic A, and you know that individual can come prepared, and this is what they do in other districts. They come prepared, perhaps um, somebody from the staff comes prepared to deliver a presentation on topic A, and they're prepared with data and information for expected questions that might come up. So it would have to have some structure and curation to it, but um, I, do, I do think it, it's important for us to provide an opportunity for conversation. We don't have that. We're starting it a little bit with our strategic plan, and this provides a really good opportunity for us to delve a little deeper into it and see what it nets us, because I, I have been coming to these meetings for a long time. I have not seen progress in this area. No. Yeah, and I think we can all agree on that. Well, I think it comes down to, like Rose has mentioned, and I mentioned previously in previous board meetings, I don't think reducing public commentary, like the options of having it at the beginning and the, at the end, is going to solve any issue. I think we need to look at the root cause of the issues and solve that, because then the outcome of that will be a reduction in public commentary. If we take away, let's say, the last portion, I think it's going to upset a lot of people, and maybe instead of coming to speak, they're going to have protests, or they're going to, you know, email us a lot more, or they're going to schedule meetings with Mr. Heath, or, you know, whatnot. And I, I know we're going to eventually ask for a levy, too, and I just don't think, we saw the Lake County commissioners just <laughs> reduce their public commentary, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of articles written about that, and it did not look good to a lot of people. So, But I think that's the point of having, implementing a new dialogue space, right, so that we can address dis difference and disagreement um, so that we can address, because the root cause of issue A might be different depending on who you're talking to, right? There's difference of opinion. One-way monologues do nothing to solve that. They don't. And so if we're going to pave the way for a levy ask in the future, we better start getting out there and talking to our community. Again, total credit to Mr. Heath for already starting that. I think we need to expand it. And I, I would agree with you. I'm all for the town hall. I'm for a, an additional avenue, but I'm not for removing or replacing anything else. So that's where I stand. OK. I, I think it's always good to revisit. We have a new board now and, and have new discussions. So are, is there any other discussion that we want to have regarding around that? Okay, our second um, area, it's also, it's not on the agenda, but um, Mrs. Iapolo asked that we discuss um, discipline. We've had some discipline concerns um, kind of on the rise lately, and as Mr. Heath mentioned, we've had a specific rise in some like insubordinate behavior and, and those types of things, so I, okay, I'll be quick because of the time, but... Um, yeah, so I, this is something that I, um, this has been, it's kind of on my list of, of things to tackle, and it's a big issue as a parent, um, and just also now as a board member, but um, as I'm working on it for next month's agenda, um, I'm hearing more and more between the kids, and then just from people asking me, do you hear about fights? I heard that a teacher was injured separating a fight. Um, you know, the, the kids, the, the teenagers in my house joke that, you know, when you go into the bathroom, there's a puff of smoke, you can't even get in there. They're, they're joking that they dehydrate themselves all day so they don't have to use the bathroom till they get home. So, I mean, I was just kind of like, enough is enough. So that's the reason that I, with my last minute um, agenda request, and um, I missed the deadline, so that's why it wasn't on the agenda. But um, I guess what I want to do is similar with the cell phone policy. I don't know that we need to tweak the policy at all. Um, it may just be, let's talk about it. Let's. I would like to get some data. I know that um, our policy um, says that our <clears throat> superintendent should give us updates on um, just some stats on discipline and infraction. So I'd like to get some of those things 
hear from our principals? What, what do they think is holding them back from getting this under control? Um, I know that we use the um, PBIS, the um, positive behavioral intervention support, and that's, I think, uh, a little too maybe too soft for these kids these days. I think we need to get a little tougher. So I guess my call to action is to let's can we get some data in front of us um, so that we as a board can look and see what do we need to do? Is it just going to be you know I want to know what our what our um, do we need to bring back tougher consequences? Do we need a lot of students when we talked to them in that AP class said we want mm -hmm. in school suspensions back. <laughs> Getting an out of school suspension is like a vacation, and I agree. So. You know, I know there's that's a probably a funding thing because we don't have the staff for that. The vaping, you know, it's not just vaping and smoking nicotine. They are getting high and and all day in school, so that's a huge issue. So I think um, maybe we have to look at spending some money to have you know and and, and let students know there's going to be more searches, um, you know, for vaping. And you know, I know there was discussion about um, detectors. Um, I don't know. There's good and bad um, how, how, how effective those are. So um, I just, you know, the bottom line is this is a tough world, and we kids thrive on, on tough but kind, gentle but tough discipline, and we need to make sure that our kids understand that there's consequences to their actions because when they leave here, um, you know, life isn't going to be gentle to them. They're not going to get five, six, seven, you know, chances. So I just think that we owe it to our kids, especially to our students that are repeat offenders who we know come from very difficult home lives. They, they need that discipline and that love in school more than anybody. So, you know, we need to discipline equally to all of our students and certainly support them. And, you know, getting in trouble frequently is a red flag, so support them, but they still have to know they're gonna get that consequence, and maybe maybe they'll, there's incentive there for them to not start a fight or not to be vaping in the bathroom. So I guess my call to action, like I said, is the, to get some data and then we can revisit, and I don't know if the safety um, committee wants to come up with ideas and then we can look at the policies uh, um, in our um, policy liaison committee and then come together, but yeah. something needs we need to take action. I think the safety committee, because I had actually, before you asked to put it on the agenda, I had already <laughs> I had sent an email to uh, Craig and I said, hey, we have that safety, you know, can we have a safety meeting? Because they also have uh, SRO. Oh, yeah, SRO. Yes, yeah, so we want to go ahead with the retired um, police officer issues and, and program. But I had mentioned that I wanted to talk about discipline as well. I, I think we could have that discussion at this in the safety meeting. I'd be fine with that. And, and if you could yeah. come with the data, I think that would be great, because I know Ohio Revised Code, we've had this issue before where people are like, why doesn't it show up on your website as bullying? How many bullying? But Ohio Revised Code is so specific in terms of what the definition of bullying is. If it doesn't meet that exact definition, it's not technically bullying. But I think it would be helpful to have incidents that are listed or whatnot. Yeah, and that's why we kind of expanded the way we actually report that now, too. Mm -hmm. We'll still have the bullying data, which is the, the requirement, but uh, yeah, we call it like mean behaviors, yeah. um, and we've pulled all of those discipline uh, codes as well and have that uh, on our website now too. Um, but yeah, that's that's something we can easily pull and, uh, and have a presentation on here in, in May. Also, our student code of conduct that, that all of our policies refer to is um, a little outdated, it's, yeah. and it was very difficult to find, so if we can maybe... Maybe that's something we need to look at and maybe um, do like a behavior or discipline rubric and make things more specific. You know, if you do this, this is what's happening to you um, and streamline it and then let kids know, you know, they, they need boundaries and, you know, a guardrail sometimes. So that might be something that we, we need to do to tweak. When we have the, um, the safety committee meeting, if you could bring that information. And then I had emailed you, I was trying to, find it so I could find the date. I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday of last week about just asking for some specific things. I, mm -hmm. I wish I had it in front of me and I could list out what I, what I, I asked for. Because um, I was looking at that for that earlier too and I couldn't find it again. Okay. After I, I know I read it and then yeah. I and tried to find it to add to my notes and I don't know. I'll, I'll find it and make sure you, you have it but there there were several things I had asked for, like um, progressive discipline policy, um, 
the incidences, are we seeing trends? Um, if so, what are the trends? What recommendations would you make for the board to take action on? Are we looking at um, repeat offenders or once someone is disciplined, are they, you know, are they likely to continue to be repeat offenders or not? And, and how quickly do we ramp up the repeat offenders? So, so there were several things and then, you know, kind of what were the precipitating events, you know, or what are, what are the, the fights revolving around? Is this mean girl things? Are these you know, bigger issues that we, sh we could address as a board? So um, I'll, I'll find that email. I know, it, I think it was in an email chain. I think that's yeah. why we can't find it right away, but in, we can get that data then for our safety committee good. meeting. Two but, things yeah. come to mind. One is to be sure that we remain with our policy and oversight role and that we let Mr. Heath do the implementation. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that caught my attention this week, the, something that we all received, a characterization of an incident. Wow. And as it turned out, that incident was nothing like the young person had reported at home, prompting this angry email because the, the uh, parent or guardian accepted the child's explanation, having taught middle school for nine years, having raised my own children, <laughs> that sometimes it's their perception, sometimes it's the story they'd like to mm -hmm. share with you, whatever it is, that what caught my eye was not that contradiction, that it was that the, the parent was all in and outraged, yeah. wanted heads to roll, because, you know, this infraction when we never heard a peep after the, the facts were revealed. And as a parent, I would have felt <laughs> <laughs> that my child had some explaining to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are, bringing that up, what was the, like, what is your, I don't want to say point, but what, my what are you point, getting at with My the, point the is that sometimes one of the most difficult pieces in the whole discipline world mm -hmm. is the expectation that the parent or the home might have for what's appropriate or what they accept is true or not true. I always think about the number of students who have a, parents who say, you know, if somebody hits you, mm -hmm. you fight back. You know, that, that's a whole complicated mm -hmm. um, situation so that when the implementation of discipline, whether it's restorative discipline or progressive discipline or whatever program you might use, it's never simple. And that I think the complexity of the world in which our children are living and what they see modeled in media, mm -hmm. you know, is sometimes atrocious. And it makes it very difficult. So you can... You can promote all the, the kindness and you know collaboration, teamwork, and caring for one another, but if you have somebody who's going to treat an adult who is there to supervise like their servant, mm -hmm. I just find that stunning. Well, we also received that one email, too, about... Um the one person ended up resigning because of yeah. the behavior in the yeah. high school. Absolutely the mm -hmm. ugly, rude, disrespectful behavior. And you know, it's it's hard if you weren't there to witness it, you know. I so I don't envy and I don't second guess anybody who's in that role, but I recognize we all want our students to be safe. We want them to be good people and behave appropriately. You know, the bathroom issue is a chronic one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, resources. So do you put extra dollars into supervisory resources? Mm -hmm. Make sure that we're not micromanaging Mr. Yeah. Heath. I think that's important because I absolutely respect his role in this and how he, you know, he's got the experience and this is his team. And it, I think it's appropriate that we speak up when we have concerns. Mm -hmm. That's that's perfectly good. But beyond that, I don't want to get into the, the details. 
And the outcome of that situation, the final email we got, we indeed saw that it was yeah. being handled appropriately by staff. And so I do agree that it's important for us to your mean behavior, as you called it. Um, is that something that is also reflected in the student code of conduct? You know, is that, or do those align or is there still work to do there to bring them in alignment? Yeah, because all of those are, have, are, have specific codes that are to our code of conduct. So Perfect. Um, yeah, those are all included. Excellent. I just want to specify what you're talking about and that, you know, that I think, I don't think that's a problem. I think they handle it perfectly. I think they're, they're on top of it. I'm talking about assaults. I'm talking about rolling on the ground, punching, fighting, happening in schools. Mm -hmm. That's, that's where I think, and it's not, I'm not criticizing. I'm not, I think I'm, that's very, it's well within our lane to say, we need to look at what's happening because whatever is, well, whatever we're doing isn't working. So, um, of course I ways with, you know, he needs us to bring up stuff and so again I, I don't I'm not I think that those minor disciplinary issues those are handled and they're on top of it it's these major things these are you know you step outside of school and you commit this kind of assault you're in trouble it shouldn't happen in school that's we have enough should be a safer safer space so that's really what I'm focusing on so just to clarify okay any more discussion on that Okay, next we have hearing of the public on any topic. Carol Ashdown, 6085. I couldn't read the rest of it. Two documents, and one was the Ohio Revised Code 3313.6011, Sex Education in Ohio Schools. And it's kind of funny considering all of this conversation. And the second was an analysis of audits for 22 and 23 conducted by the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. So there were 607 Ohio schools who, but not to the point where it is cutting time away from us. I promise you, if you take our voices away, you will never get a levy out of anybody in the school district. I wanna thank you all tonight for listening to us and being there for our children. Have a good evening. Thank you. Andrea, Andrea Bliss, 5421 Liberty Street. I was going to pass to uh, save some time, but I decided that maybe we could just use some kindness. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Superintendent Heath and anyone else involved in making the decision to use a calamity day for yesterday's eclipse. <laughs> I often tease my kids about how modern technology has ruined snow days, but we all agreed that the virtual day over the winter was well worth it. I appreciate that you listened to the officials requesting that people stay off the roads. My family and I had a great time, as I'm sure everyone else did, safely enjoying this awe-inspiring event and sleeping in. So again, thank you very much for letting us have the day off school. <laughs> thank you. Just as an FYI, I had a kid come up to me at uh, one of the buildings today and ask for a snow day. <laughs> I said, you just got a day off yesterday. Are you kidding me? I said, you do realize it's a remote day now, so you're going to have to Mr. do Heath, stuff anyway. Mr. Heath, your three minutes are up. Sorry, my three minutes are up. Uh, James Cheerian, 7940 Newell Creek. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Heath and Mr. Wade. Uh, this is late in coming, but I wanted to give my heartfelt appreciation for the Black History Month showcase that was held last month. It was amazing to see this whole space filled to capacity with standing room only. Uh, There's so many positive things to share, the incredible work by the students, of course, but also the teachers that guided them through it, the administration, staff, and board members that were in attendance. A special shout out, especially to this is Zedric, who worked hard, so hard behind the scenes to coordinate it all coming together and to become this one cohesive presentation. I wish I could mention all the names and good things I saw that night from the NAACP youth to students from Howard University. The list can go on and on. But there are two things that were really significant to me that I'd like to highlight. The first is Mr. Heath putting the weight of his position behind the event. I will always felt 
that if change is going to happen, it has to be more than just grassroots. There has to be just as much momentum and energy coming from leadership, administration, and teachers for that kind of change to become reality. So I'm grateful that Mr. Heath chose to be up front leading the presentation that night with Mrs. Zedrick. He could have easily delegated the responsibility or chosen to be too busy that night, but by simply being there, it speaks volumes to this district and community that what we value, we value diversity, we value equity, we value inclusion, and I really appreciate that. So thank you. I think that takes courage and conviction, especially in light of the climate we live in currently. The second thing that night was a conversation I was a part of with a black parent in the district. His family moved back here back in the 80s, one of the few black families at that time. His children went to school here a few years ago, and he shared with us the stories that are typical of the black experience here in this country, and specifically here in Mentor when it comes to racism. So when he came to the event last month, he was blown away. He said something to the effect, never in my whole life would I expect Mentor schools to put on a Black History Month event, but here we are. He was excited, but he was also wistful. I could tell it was a bittersweet experience for him, because I could tell he was looking back on his experience as a parent here in the 80s and 90s and seeing everybody here in this room celebrating black history. I, I can't even imagine what that feeling would have been like for him. Uh, I lost my spot. <laughs> he was excited, but he was wistful. I learned something from that conversation. There's so much more work to be done, but listening to stories like that, I know we are making progress. One such area I know we have room for progress in is the problem of high student to teacher ratios in our classroom. I know some community members addressed that issue here last month. If one of the solutions is to hire more teachers, I would again strongly encourage the district that those teachers be highly qualified people, but also from diverse backgrounds. I'll email you the rest. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lynn Mazika. Connie Periskevis. <clears throat> Good evening, Superintendent Heath and distinguished board members. Thank you for giving me time to speak. I had planned to say all your names and give you all eye contact, but I think I'm going to shorten it. <laughs> My name is Connie Periskevis. I live in Maplewood and Mentor on the Lake. I'm a retired teacher with a master's and curriculum instruction. I've taught 33 years in elementary, middle school, and high school combined. That was in both private and public schools. I'm here to promote a balanced curriculum, part of your mission statement. Right now, it appears choices are being made to normalize high-risk sexual behavior in the school curriculum and not allowing young, vulnerable minds a period of innocence. I am suggesting you implement a pro-family curriculum and sensible moral messaging, void of political ideologies. With that said, my first suggestion is to adopt Sky Tree Book Fairs. They offer transparency for families and are committed to family-friendly values. They believe that book fairs should not contain hidden, explicit content targeting kids. Their books are age appropriate. Next, I suggest you adopt books from the American Cornerstone Institute's Little Patriots program. It is an all-in-one platform featuring online lessons at home activities, patriotic books, and sing-alongs to teach children about our country's founding principles. Finally, I propose that PragerU free lesson plans be used because they are developed to cover multiple educational standards in one lesson that is fun, interacting, and entertaining. Teachers can implement content grounded in traditional values that inspire self-reliance, patriotism, and resiliency, while teaching foundational knowledge in subjects ranging from civics to financial literacy. In conclusion, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month, too. And if you do not address the immoral, ideological, and sexual issues targeting children now, consider yourselves complicit in making them vulnerable for abuse. ADAPT was part of your mission statement as well. So I'm asking you, ADAPT. Thank you for looking into these additions into the curriculum. 
and thank you for letting me speak tonight in public. Thank you. Thank you. Gil Martello, 6880 South Camelot. Good evening, Mr. Heath, Mr. Wade, and members of the board. The past 24 months, I have witnessed much that can lead one to question the direction of this school district. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent on reading and curriculum materials many taxpayers in this district would strongly object to if they were made aware of. Given the economic times and the pandemic, spending approximately four and a half million dollars on a sports facility a short while ago might have not been the most prudent use of our dollars. We have had several book challenges that have resulted in emotional rants with little if any objective evidence demonstrating the value of the book in question. Our school buildings remain inadequately staffed by resource officers. In the recent past, there's been enough evidence to prompt an investigation into the possibility that a majority of school board members met and in the process broke sunshine laws and the Open Meetings Act. This board has not taken decisive action prohibiting biological males from entering the private facilities of biological females. The Mentor Teachers Association and three sitting board members heartily endorsed a candidate who would have clearly struggled with the responsibilities of being a board member. This lapse in judgment brings into question all they may, might decide on in the future and raises the specter of a conflict of interest. Because of what I have mentioned, how many very good students have left the Mentor School District for the option of attending private schools are being homeschooled. Household budgets are being eviscerated by inflation. Given what I have stated, do you believe the people with their financial backs up against the wall are going to support a school system, possibly a levy increase, and a superintendent they cannot be proud of or see value in? On the possibility of curtailing the public portion of school board meetings, relocating books to an age-appropriate area is not book banning. However, limiting or preventing a taxpayer from speaking to their elected representatives in a public forum is the epitome of banning free speech. I'd like to take the next 30 seconds or so. I pull up to this building every morning at 6.30 to drop my daughter off. And every morning I drop my daughter off, I'm asking myself, am I doing the right thing? by allowing my daughter to come to this school. I got to tell you, if it were, if she were in eighth grade, she'd be going to private school because I'm not seeing this board with moral clarity to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Halad, Reynolds Road. <clears throat> Sorry, there's something in my throat. Uh, I, I just want to stress, out of sitting here the entire meeting, I am so flabbergasted at just the absolute fight against freedom of speech, the fight against protecting our kids in schools. Like, it should be a no-brainer. I wake up every day and go, gee, pornography is not good for kids. That should be pretty simple. It should be kind of like black, white. That's pretty simple. It's cut, or, it's cut and dry. Oh, I, it's, it's, you, you guys got to sleep with that at night. I don't. It's not on my conscience. I do want to talk about your, uh, since I spoke about this earlier, I do want to talk about your programming. It took me all of... 10 seconds to research competitors uh, to Nearpod. It, there's plenty of them. Uh, I will email every board member here. I know I will only hear back from two. The only two that will respond are Rose and Annie, unfortunately. Uh, my son 
during a remote, when he was in your schools, by the way, um, I expressed concern that a five-year-old, I don't have screens in my house, he doesn't have a tablet, he doesn't have a phone, he doesn't have an iPad, he doesn't have screens, period, right? They gave him an iPad, brand new one, at the start of kindergarten, much to my dismay. And I said, I don't want it in my house. My son was able to hack into your system and email school administrators, calling them buttholes. Okay, yes, my son did that. I will admit that that was probably not appropriate, but my son hacked in and emailed plenty of administrators. Okay, that's, it's a children don't, we don't need to give them iPads, especially kids at five years old. Um, I noticed something when there was a remote learning day. Um, they use YouTube videos. And unfortunately, it's up to the teacher's discretion what lesson that they're showing that day with Nearpod. However, when that child is connected to you, YouTube that can access YouTube at a kindergarten level, by the way, there's no limitations, um, what plays next is not in control of the school. So I just want to bring that up that there's plenty of plenty of competitors out there. Uh, I don't think, um, I will not be supporting a tax levy until we get this, this thing under wraps. The books in schools are huge. You should see that meetings that last five hours plus, we're compassionate about it. We're not gonna stop showing up for our kids. And uh, this, this next Nearpod thing has to go. And with that, um, I thank you guys for uh, coming and doing your thing. Thank you. Jacqueline McCormick, 9765 Ridgeview Trail. And looking over tonight's agenda, I noticed the superintendent's recommendations for classified staff. I saw the names of several classified staff coming and going. One name seems to be missing. I'd like to address that. Apparently, Lindsay Wall was unable to fulfill Excuse her me. obligations as we, a long-term We do not, we don't assistant. mention names. Last month, I, along with other community members and parents, brought forth concerns about her violating several board policies. We have filed requ record requests to see the exact violations that I'm sorry, can you please cut release. the mic? No, Maggie. I'm Ms. sorry, Mrs. but. Mrs. Cook, we were moment. advised by legal, though, that we cannot, we can't. When it comes to employees, one, we can't. One moment, please. Um, we have a procedure, if you want to talk to us about employees, that we can go into She's executive session. I would like to have a board vote if we're going to do that, because I, we had the open meeting with our attorney, and it's, anybody could search it, and they specifically stated that we can't, that's, that's designating, sorry, <laughs> I'm taking up some time. It's, it's content of speech. We cannot, we can't regulate content of speech unless it's FERPA, which we were told. I mean, that's in our special meeting from a couple weeks ago. So we can ask, and I think you did that, but I think we're going to get ourselves into legal troubles, and I would actually recommend us talking to our attorney before we say cut the mic and don't let somebody speak. I think we need clarity on that from our attorney if, or pull up the I thought it was video. in our policy that we weren't supposed to name names of um, employees. <laughs> Current or former from the district. Or community members. Or a specific. And or community or members. Community we members. don't attack yeah. community so, members. I, excuse, excuse you. Um, I, so I guess, and also I didn't think we were supposed to talk about attorney recommendations. That was in a public table. open meeting. Yeah, it was, a, it was a, like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it was in our ago. session. Yeah, so we I can talk sure. about that. Um, we could adjourn to executive session, though. Yeah, we could certainly adjourn to executive session if you wanted to talk to us about that. I, I first would like us to contact our attorney because I think if we tell somebody they can't speak at the mic, my impression of what was told was that we could be held liable legally if, if we're regulating content of speech. When we talked about and we were talking about executive session, I thought she told us specifically. Yeah, she said we that was an option, right. but if somebody Try continued to speak, we can't. We can't regulate their content of speech, but unless it's for as long as it's within our policy, though. Mm -hmm. because but our policy doesn't align with the law. Then I don't recall. Hmm. I'm just I'm just saying, I don't think we want to make that decision unless we're ready to 
have a legal battle because I know people will take it there. So. Yeah, that, that's not how I understood it. I mean, I'm not trying to just go against the law. I just, I understood that your speech at a, at a meeting, excuse me. Yes, please. Excuse me. Please stop speaking while we're having a meeting. Um, we had, my understanding was that we could set parameters in our policy because speaking is a privilege at a meeting that we don't need to allow any speech. And we have created a policy. And if they're within those parameters, then that's The policy okay. doesn't speak to that, though. The policy doesn't speak to talking about. The new policy does right, not. Right, we took it out because we verified okay. with legal when we made the policy that we can't do that. We can't regulate content of speech. We can regulate meeting uh, the time that they are allowed to speak. We can regulate how much or whether we do it at all, but it has to be applied to everybody then. We can't say, oh, I don't like what she's bringing up, so she can't speak, but then Joe Schmo, he can get up to and talk about finances. It's all or nothing. Okay, then I stand corrected. Um, so we're, we're gonna continue, I apologize. And please continue, and out of decency, I ask you to not speak about a fellow citizen, but it is your right. <clears throat> Last month, I, along with other community members and parents, brought forth concerns about her violating several board policies. We have filed record requests to see the exact violations that incurred prior to her release. But the part of the story that is most shocking is that you, Virginia Jessling, and you, Maggie Cook, both enthusiastically and loudly endorsed this woman as a school board candidate last year. Then you went on to vote for her to be hired as an employee. That goes directly against your policies of avoiding a conflict of interest or an appearance of one. And as long as we are throwing people under the bus, the men are teachers of Association, commonly referred to as the MTA, also endorsed Mrs. Wall for the school board. Last fall, when you people chose to make these endorsements, many of us were terribly befuddled. What qualifications and expertise does this person bring to a school district with a $120 million annual budget? She lasted a little over a month as an employee. I wonder how quickly she would have realized she was unable to fulfill the much more complicated duties of being a school board member. What were you and Ginny, Ginny and Maggie thinking when you endorsed this woman for school board? You should be embarrassed and humiliated, and so should every MTA member who endorsed and voted for her. Many community members are losing respect for the district due to the terrible decisions like this being made. MTA, learn from this mistake and don't dabble into politics with our children. Stop endorsing and donating large amounts to liberal extreme leftist candidates while stating that you're not pushing political ideology on our children. We would like to see a letter from Ginny and Maggie stating that they will no longer endorse candidates. We will be sending the same request to the Men and <coughs> Teachers Association. That would be a good start to show the community you won't be using our children for political gain. Remember, a levy will be coming up and you'll need our support. The reserve open access library system and red traffic light systems proposed are absolutely ridiculous. You are essentially flagging children instead of inappropriate books and eliminating the ability to challenge these books and have them removed. Considering you no longer have numerous media specialists, the odds of inappropriate materials entering our library are quite significant. This proposed system is unacceptable and inappropriate books will not be tolerated in our school library. Parents and taxpayers deserve to be heard in all aspects of our schools in which we financially support and entrust our children. Unfortunately, members of this board have repeatedly ignored requests and questions from the public via email, forcing the public to address the board at these meetings. Any limits put upon the public's ability to address the board will ensure the failure of any upcoming levies. Thanks. <laughs> Dean Paris Gavas. Thank you. Uh, good evening, board. I'd like to, I'm going to relinquish my time, but I'd like to address the mothers that are fighting for their children. I think it's admirable that uh, they want to take the time to fight for their children and tell you what their opinions are. I think it's very admirable. and. I think it's running late, so I'm going to cut it short. Thank you. Our last speaker is Kathy McAdams, 973 Yellowwood. Good 
Good evening. Well, it's almost midnight. Um, just to, to I, I have several things to say. To follow up on something someone said earlier, I have sent emails to the board asking questions the last two months and not received an answer from three of the board members, most particularly the president or vice president. Um, further, your policy that you just cited um, was voted on by you. We, the public, are not subject to your policy unless our children, our ch if we have children in the school, then we are. Next, the people who have the courage to get up here, and trust me, it takes courage, deserve your undivided attention, not looking at the windows, not looking bored or at your fingers or making faces at each other, because I've witnessed that. They deserve your undivided attention. Um, two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, the board voted to respond to, uh, to questions asked, asked during the public speaking portion of the meetings. Two, two years ago, 18 months ago, whatever you want to call it, that happened one month. It has not been followed up on at all. I have asked questions at the meetings. Nobody, and I have gotten back up at the podium and asked again, and I still never got an answer the next month. So you have to follow your own policies. All right. Um, the reason I really got up here was because April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. And I am very passionate about this. My husband was a CASA, a court-appointed special um, assistant, at, in Geauga County, and he did a phenomenal, they do a phenomenal job. But I was at a Lake County Commissioner meeting recently, and these are the statistics that I heard, and these are appalling. In the smallest county of Ohio last year, there were over 1,500 reports of alleged child abuse. That's 1,500 in Lake County alone. There were more than 1,500 children involved in those allegations. That's 1,500 families. Abuse includes, but is not limited to, physical abuse, verbal abuse, mental abuse, child sexual exploitation and abuse, bullying, cyberbullying by peers and adults, emotional abuse, mutilation of the female genitalia, and child trafficking and child slavery. Mandated reporters of suspected abuse, including everybody at every level of education, from custodians to school board members to superintendents. If they don't report their suspicions and they don't have to have firm information, they can lose their licenses. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we do not have an executive session on the agenda, so um, we will move on. And do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Mr. Wade, please call the roll. Ms. Payne. Yes. Ms. Uh, Dressling. Yes. Ms. Ayapolo. Yes. Ms. Porchaza. Yes. Ms. Cook. Yes. Meetings adjourn at 10.51 p.m.